we'll uh, call the hearing, hearing to order this morning. Uh, the title of today's hearing is the Fiscal Year 2012 Department of Energy and Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission uh, budgets. And we certainly um, extend a warm welcome to Secretary Stephen Chu, Secretary, U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we appreciate your being with us uh, today very much and look forward to your testimony. Uh, we also uh, have with us on the second panel the Honorable Gregory Jasko, who's chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, circumstances have certainly changed since we uh, decided to have this hearing, and with the events uh, taking place in Japan, we all want to extend our very best wishes and thoughts to the people of Japan and as a result of this uh, tragedy. And we'll certainly benefit today from the insights of Dr. Chu and Dr. Jasko on uh, this ongoing matter. Uh, obviously, nuclear energy plays a vital role in the energy needs of our country today. It provides roughly 20 percent of all electricity generated in America. Countries like uh, France and Japan have an even greater percentage of electricity produced from energy. And uh, we recognize the importance when we talk about energy also of the safety aspect of that as well. And while I didn't really intend to talk a lot about nuclear energy today, there are uh, so many uh, points relating to our country as it uh, pertains to nuclear energy today. We uh, the storage issue, Yucca Mountain, what's happening there, the 104, 106 uh, uh, nuclear plants around the country and th the location on those sites of the waste material instead of going to Yucca Mountain, uh, the permitting period, uh, roughly 10 years to get a plant permitted. Uh, in other countries, it's less than that, but uh, as we've learned, just in the last few days from what happened in Japan, we can uh, expect unexpected events to occur, and we have to maximize safety. I, I, for one, do not believe that we can meet our future demands of energy without nuclear playing a vital role in that. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, we are going to look forward to your testimony. I know that uh, there will be a lot of questions for you. and. Uh, at this time, I would recognize for his opening statement, uh, Mr. Rush of Illinois. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Secretary uh, Chu and uh, Chairman, uh, Mr. Secretary Chu for being here today. I understand we have Chairman Jasko coming in a little later. Before I give my thoughts on the nuclear situation in Japan, uh, as you have, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to bring attention to the drastic cuts that have been proposed by my Republican colleagues under H.R. 1, Section 3001 uh, of H.R. 1, would rescind all unobligated Recovery Act funds without any exception. And these cuts would directly impact crucial job, cre job creating renewable energy projects under the Loan Guarantee Program. At least 26 job creating projects across the country, from California to Illinois, Michigan to New York, and Oregon to Texas, will be affected by these proposed cuts. In all, projects with negotiated term sheets of $12.5 billion in loan guarantees that will create over 28,000 construction, construction jobs and over 5,000 permanent jobs are at stake. The Republican proposal would basically put all of DOE loan guarantee funding into one category, and that category is nuclear energy. And while I am a supporter of nuclear energy, I also believe we must invest in renewable energy projects that will generate power from solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, and cellulistic ethanol, as many of these projects do. Mr. Chairman, my state of Illinois obtains 47 percent of its electricity from nuclear, one of the highest in the nation. I personally believe that nuclear must be part of any portfolio of renewable energy sources that will move this uh, nation forward. 
However, as far as the events unfolding in Japan are concerned, my advice for the nuclear energy industry, both here and in Japan um, and elsewhere, would be to be as transparent as possible. Transparency is really uh, the key word. The American people, the people around the world are looking for transparency. They want to believe in the nuclear energy, and I think it is up to us and others to make that happen. We must make sure that we are honest with the American people about exactly what we know and also what we do not know. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Chairman, I look forward to discussing this more in depth uh, during the discussion uh, with uh, Secretary Chu and Chairman Yasto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I want to recognize uh, Mr. Waxman. Yeah, I yield back to about some of my time. Ms. Brush, uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, I noticed you had about two minutes left on your opening statement. I had about two minutes left on my opening statement, and I was looking so forward to what, hear what you said that I neglected to recognize my friend Mr. Shimkus, who's uh, chairman of the Energy and Environment Subcommittee, so I'm going to recognize him for the remaining two minutes of my opening statement. So, Mr. Shimkus, you're recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. Uh, uh, we always live in interesting times, and uh, this is uh, another one. Um, this, is a, this is a DOE budget hearing, um, and of course, budgets are all the rage, uh, size of government spending. Uh, the, the, your budget request is $29.5 billion, which is about a 12 percent increase from fiscal year 2010. Um, so a lot of questions will be Obviously, that's not going to happen. Uh, we're going to have to prioritize, and we're going to have to see what works and go through the list and make sure we're funding the, the priorities. But nowhere in America is anyone expecting us to increase the size of government and federal agencies by 12 percent. In fact, I would, as I said in another hearing, be prepared for 2008 spending levels uh, or a, a significantly reduced amount. So that, that's an issue. Having said that, um, we uh, want to, you know, applaud and uh, the work and want to continue to support, as Mr. Rush said, I'm from Illinois also, the, the nuclear power industry, make sure it's safe. There are interesting issues going on with your loan guarantees that we want to keep pursuing the, the three facilities that are moving forward. Uh, while we still have to address, and my subcommittee has the nuclear waste portfolio, and, and We've got to get serious about addressing this issue. Um, I'll talk about that more in my questions, but for the president to have a, a blue ribbon commission that excludes any discussion about Yucca Mountain is is a fraud. So, and I think you probably had some writings in the past that that also addressed the importance of Yucca Mountain, and we'll continue to push in all the above energy strategies. So, with that, my time's expired, Mr. Chairman. So, you back. And at this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, the ranking member, for his opening statement. During the, uh, Mr. Chairman, during the last year, we've had wake-up call after wake-up call warning us that we need a new energy policy. Last April, a coal mine explosion in West Virginia killed 29 miners. It was the worst coal disaster in 40 years. That same mo month, Deepwater Horizon exploded in BP's Macondo Well. Uh, oil was gushing into the Gulf for three months. Now oil is $100 a barrel because the Middle East is in turmoil. And Japan faces potential nuclear meltdowns at its damaged reactors. We don't know yet whether Japan will be able to avoid catastrophic release of radioactive material. We don't know whether we, uh, w what the full impact will be, but we should be investigating the safety and preparedness of the U.S. facilities. After all these energy catastrophes, it should be obvious we need a new energy policy that promotes clean, safe, and affordable energy. We need more vehicles that run on electricity, natural gas, and renewable fuels. We need more wind and solar power and we need more energy efficiency. Instead, what we have gotten from the Republican-controlled House is partisanship, 
and an assault on clean energy. The Republican budget for this year, H.R. 1, would slash DOE's energy efficiency and renewable energy budget by 35 percent. It would completely eliminate assistance to low-income families who want to weatherize their homes or save energy and lower their utility bills. And the Republican budget would wipe out DOE's ability to award loan guarantees to worthy renewable energy projects. This would cost us uh, thousands of jobs. Some of these uh, loan guarantees have recipients just waiting to close the deal, and now there'll be no money left for them, whether it's a solar project in California, a wind turbine plant in Idaho, a geothermal project in Oregon, a biofuels facility in Louisiana, the list goes on. All these projects and all these jobs are on the Republican chopping block. Yesterday in this committee, we debated a bill, and the Republicans said, oh, we're for all of the above energy policy. But that's not what is in their budget. The Republican budget would rescind $25 billion of the $47 billion in loan guarantee authority provided by Congress in 2009. The bill would preserve the entire $18.5 billion in loan guarantees for new nuclear reactors and $2 billion available, available for uranium enrichment projects while leaving only $1.5 billion for all other technologies. This is not an all of the above strategy. This is an all nuclear strategy. Mr. Chairman, instead of spending our time debating partisan legislation that denies science and guts the Clean Air Act, we should be working together to encourage clean energy investments that will create jobs in the U.S. It should not take a nuclear meltdown to make us face reality. We urgently need a new energy policy, and I hope the testimony today from Secretary Chu and Chairman Jasko will help point the way. I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a supplemental memo detailing the effects of the Republican budget on clean energy jobs. Without objection. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield now to the uh, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Environment, Mr. Green. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing today on the Department of Energy and Nuclear Regulatory Commission's FY12 proposed budgets. I want to thank Secretary Chu and also Chairman Yasko for taking the time to appear before our committee. Today. I know both of you are extremely busy uh, working with Japan to assist them in um, their current situation at several of their nuclear reactors. Our thoughts and our prayers are with the people of Japan, and I hope the United States can assist them in their time of need. This is truly a devastating disaster, and they need as much assistance from around the world as, uh, so they can recover. As a member of Congress who represents one of the largest energy producing areas in the country, an area of the country that also has permits uh, pending before the Office of Management and Budget for construction of new nuclear power uh, plants, I'm interested in the testimony of our witnesses today. In 2008, our nation produced over 800 billion kilowatt hours from nuclear power. Japan produced 245 billion. We need to step back and take a breath and see what we need to do to produce clean electric uh, electricity safely and at a reasonable cost. Um, and I know that's our bottom line, and we need to do that, uh, particularly what's happened with Japan. Uh, but And I do hope that Secretary Chu and uh, Chairman Has Yasko can update us on the current situation in Japan as well as give us information on the uh, FY12 budget and how we can, uh, Congress can take the leadership in doing that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. The, well, Mr. Waxman, well, you Mr. Chairman, the time. I don't know if we're reserving any balance of our time, but uh, we've exhausted our speeches for the opening of the Thank time. you very much. This time I recognize the full chairman of the committee, uh, Mr. Upton, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Secretary. Uh, given all of the energy challenges the American people face, uh, this hearing on DOE and the NRC 12 budgets would have been a very important one, even if it was held before the tragedy in Japan. But given the unfolding events there and the impact on several nuclear reactors, uh, today's hearing certainly takes on added significance. In the midst of a natural disaster and a tragedy that we're watching unfold literally hour by hour, we need to allow time for reflection and careful analysis and learn from their mistakes. 
This is especially true when it comes to proposals that would make permanent changes in policy based on incomplete information. We will be having a number of hearings on this issue as details unfold and we welcome your participation. Uh, this committee is going to hear the facts as soon as they become available, that is for sure. For me, I live 15 miles from two nuclear power plants, so the safety of U.S. nuclear facilities is not an issue that I've ever taken lightly. I'm not strained for my support for safe nuclear energy as a vital component of America's present and future energy mix. It is just as important to dispel overstated fears as it is to discuss legitimate concerns, and I know that we can begin the process of doing both. The Department of Energy's 12 budget is $29.5 billion, an increase of uh, almost 12 percent, or $3 billion from current levels. And I see areas where funding is excessive and perhaps others where it is insufficient. Spending even for laudable goals like energy efficiency or developing affordable alternative energy sources and technologies needs to be scrutinized for effectiveness. Indeed, we just had a large scale real world test of the merits of throwing a lot of money at nice sounding energy projects in the 2009 stimulus. The stimulus program was very generous with American people's tax dollars and certainly for energy programs, but a series of DOE inspector general reports on stimulus spending for home and building weatherization projects and other agencies found significant flaws. In other areas, I believe that the budget is inappropriately cheap and this is especially the case with regard to fossil fuels. Wishful thinking about magic bullet alternatives is not going to heat and cool our homes, get us where we need to go and power the businesses that provide the jobs that America wants. The reality is we still need fossil fuels and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Now, I don't believe that this reality is reflected in the budget which calls for a 44 percent decline in funding for the Office of Fossil Energy. That along with the President's support for raising taxes on domestic oil and natural gas producers is indicative of a hostility to domestic fossil fuel production. On nuclear energy, we've got similar concerns. Blocking Yucca Mountain is penny wise and pound foolish, especially considering we have spent nearly $13.5 billion and the need ultimately to find a repository for nuclear waste. Instead, preventing the need for interim storage is one way of reducing risk from nuclear energy and reducing risk is certain to be a major part of the energy discussions moving forward. This committee will look long and hard at Yucca Mountain, the nuclear fuel cycle and spent fuel policies. Now more than ever, the politically based policies must end. America demands uh, safe, common sense solutions and I yield the balance of my time to the Chairman Emeritus, uh, Mr. Barton. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I concur with your statement. Uh, we welcome the distinguished Secretary of Energy and the distinguished Chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I think you know that I was a White House Fellow for one of your predecessors, Dr. Uh, James B. Edwards, so it's always good to have the Secretary of Energy here. Um, obviously, we wanted to talk about the budget, and a big part of the budget is going to be the uh, $36 billion loan guarantee program for nuclear energy. But in light of what's happened in Japan, we're obviously going to be interested in your comments about the safety and the NRC chairman's safety of our existing nuclear reactors and the new reactors that are beginning to be um, permitted and hopefully be built uh, in our nation. I continue to be a strong supporter of, of nuclear energy, and I um, uh, hope that uh, you and the president also continue to do so. I noticed that your uh, support for a clean energy standard uh, I'm not sure, Mr. Secretary, that we need any kind of an energy standard for America, but uh, I think uh, myself and others may be willing to look at it. Obviously, it depends on what the definition of clean is, and I think any definition should include uh, uh, clean coal, uh, nuclear, and uh, natural gas. With that, um, I yield back to the chairman or I yield back to the subcommittee chairman. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Barton. Uh, because of the fact that Mr. Rush did not use all of his time and had two minutes left, I am going to recognize Mr. Rush for an additional two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I yield uh, two minutes to Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rush, very much. Right now, a few dozen brave souls are fighting a nuclear meltdown with water trucks. We send our prayers to those heroes and to the people of Japan. The effects of this disaster have already rippled through the world. China, Venezuela, Germany, Switzerland, and other countries are shutting down older plants and scrapping plans for new ones. 
we too need a seismic shift in our approach to nuclear reactor safety. I fear that we are not moving fast enough to take these important steps. Just yesterday, the Department of Health and Human Services announced that it would study the distribution of potassium iodide, a radiation emergency pill that is being distributed to Japanese people and to U.S. military personnel in the region. It has been 32 years since the Kemeny Commission that investigated the Three Mile Island accident recommended it. It has been 29 years since I held a hearing and called for its use. It has been 10 years since the Nuclear Regulatory Commission began making potassium iodide available within 10 miles of a nuclear reactor. It has been nine years since this committee passed my law to expand the distribution zone of these pills from 10 miles to 20 miles away from the reactor. It has been seven years since the National Academy of Sciences endorsed its use. And yet, two administrations have ignored the law. We don't need to study these pills to death to know that they can prevent cancer. Uh, I believe that the Obama administration uh, should immediately implement uh, my law from uh, seven years ago, uh, having it be distributed within a uh, seven, uh, within a 20-mile uh, mi mile radius. Our economy crumbled because Wall Street took high-risk investments and transformed them into safe-looking bonds. As the underlying subprime loans defaulted en masse, these investments turned into toxic assets that no one wanted. So President Bush created the TARP program so the government could buy them. That's pretty much what we're looking at on nuclear loan guarantees. They're just like a toxic asset, literally and financially, guaranteed by the federal taxpayers uh, if something goes wrong. The industry will be okay financially. The taxpayers will be left. We have already known what happens when the taxpayer has to pick up the tag tab when things go wrong. We should be very careful from this moment on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Markey. At this time, uh, Secretary Chu, we recognize you for your uh, opening statement and look forward to your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chairman Whitfield, and um, I thank uh, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Waxman, uh, Mr. Barton, uh, Mr. Dingell, I don't see is here yet, and uh, of course all the members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the President's fiscal year 2012 budget request with the Department of Energy. I want to begin by expressing the administration's support for the people of Japan, as well as American citizens in Japan, as they respond to and recover from the tragic events of the past few days. Officials from the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and other agencies have maintained close contact with Japanese officials and provided the Japanese government with expertise in a variety of areas. As part of that effort, the Department of Energy has sent two experts to Japan to provide advice and technical assistance. We are positioning consequence management response teams in U.S. consulates and military installations in Japan. These teams have the skills, expertise, and equipment to help assess, survey, monitor, and sample areas. They include smaller groups that could be sent out to gather technical information in the area. We have sent our aerial measurement system capability, including detectors, analytical equipment, used to provide assessments of contamination on the ground. In total, the DOE team includes 39 people with more than 1,700 pounds of equipment. The Department is also monitoring activities through the DOE Nuclear Incident Team and is employing assets at its national laboratories to provide ongoing predictive atmospheric modeling capabilities based on a variety of scenarios. The American people should have full confidence that the United States has the rigorous safety regulations in place to ensure that our nuclear power is generated safely and responsibly. Information is still coming in about the events unfolding in Japan, but the administration is committed to learning from Jap Japan's experience as we work to continue to strengthen America's nuclear industry. Safety remains at the forefront of our effort to responsibly develop America's energy resources and we will continue to incorporate the best practices and lessons learned in that process. To meet our energy needs, the administration believes we must rely on a diverse set of energy sources, including renewables like wind and solar, natural gas, clean coal, and nuclear power. We look forward to a continued dialogue with Congress in moving that agenda forward. Now I'd like to turn to the budget. President Obama has a plan to win the future by out-innovating, out-educating, out-building the rest of the world 
while at the same time addressing the deficit the president's budget makes tough choices and cutting in many areas while recognizing that we must invest in strategic areas like clean energy innovation that will create jobs and strengthen competitiveness to that end president obama has called for an increased investments in clean energy research development and deployment in addition he has proposed a bold but achievable goal of generating eighty percent of america's electricity from clean sources by twenty thirty five a clean energy standard will provide clean long term signal a clean long term signal to industry to bring capital off the sidelines and into the clean energy sector the government does not need to pick favorites the most competitive clean energy sources will win in the marketplace part of energy's f y twelve budget requests of twenty nine point five billion dollars supports the president's goals defense related activities such as nonproliferation and cleaning up the cold war sites account for roughly half that budget the other half which includes energy and science programs are also critical national security in addition to economic competitiveness through energy efficiency programs will save money for consumers by saving energy in addition the budget supports the research development and deployment of renewable energy the modernization of the electric grid and the advancement of carbon capture and sequestration technologies and it helps reduce our dependence on oil by developing the next generation of biofuels by accelerating electric vehicles research and deployment the budget supports loans for renewables and energy efficiency technologies nuclear energy also has an important role to play in our energy portfolio the budget requests up to thirty six billion in loan guarantee authority to help deploy a new generation of american nuclear reactors it also invests in research and development of advanced nuclear technologies the budget invests in basic and applied research and keeps us on a path to doubling funding for key scientific agencies including the office of science the budget invests five hundred fifty million in advanced research projects agency energy the administration also seeks an additional one hundred million for r p e as part of the president's wireless innovation and infrastructure initiative this investment will allow r p e to continue the promising early stage research projects that aim to deliver game changing clean energy technologies another key piece of our research effort is the energy innovation hubs the hubs bring together our nation's top scientists and engineers to achieve similar game changing energy goals but where a concentrated effort over a longer time horizon is needed to establish innovation leadership the budget requests one hundred forty six million dollars to support three existing hubs and to establish three new hubs finally the budget supports the energy frontier research centers which are mostly university led teams working to solve specific scientific problems that are blocking clean energy development to reach our energy goals we must take a portfolio approach pursuing several research strategies that have proven to be successful in the past but this is not a kitchen sink approach <coughs> this work is being coordinated and prioritized with a 360 degree view of how the pieces fit together together these initiatives will help america lead in innovation this in addition to strengthening our economy the budget request also strengthens our security by providing eleven point eight billion dollars for the department's national nuclear security administration the department is mindful of our responsibility to the taxpayer we're cutting back in multiple areas including eliminating unnecessary fossil fuel subsidies we're streamlining operations and we're making some tough choices like freezing salaries and bonuses for hardworking national laboratory site and facility management contractor employees the United States faces a choice today will we outcompete the rest of the world or will we fall behind to lead the world in clean energy we must act now we can't afford not to thank you now and I'll please to answer I'll be pleased to answer any questions you may have well thank you secretary Chu and uh, because of the event in uh, Japan and Chernobyl and Three Mile Island and other events uh, uh, the news media certainly is focused on what's happening in Japan and the impact that that would have on nuclear power in America. It, it's my understanding that the International Atomic Energy Agency has a seven level international nuclear and radiological event scale and that on that scale the event that occurred in Japan was at a level four. It's my understanding that Three Mile Island was a level five, which according to the 
uh, International Atomic Energy Agency would have been more serious than even what is in Japan, is the information that I have. My question is that I read an article recently about Three Mile Island, and it said that a person standing at the property line of Three Mile Island during that event would have received a dose of radiation equivalent to between a chest x-ray and a CAT scan. And my question, as a layman, that does not sound like a lot of exposure, and particularly when you consider this would be a level five, and I was just curious, uh, are you aware of that kind of exposure at Three Mile Island, or do you have any additional information on that? Uh, <clears throat> My, my knowledge of Three Mile Island actually comes from uh, an NRC report that was issued, uh, I, I don't know exactly when, but later after the analysis had been done. And what I remember is within a 20 mile or so radius that the average exposure of those people uh, closest to Three Mile Island was a very small fraction of background radiation. It could have been of scale 1% or less. Right. That's, that's what I recall. Um, well, I, you know, I think that's important that we talk about that because obviously safety is an important issue. We don't work, want the American people to be panicked about any of this. And uh, did you have an additional comment yes, you were going to make? I do. Um, I think the, um, the events unfolding uh, in the Japan uh, incidents um, actually appeared to be more serious than Three Mile Island. To what extent, we don't really know now. Uh, and so as they're unfolding very rapidly on an hour by hour, day by day basis, and there are conflicting reports, and so we don't really know in, in detail what's happening. This is one of the reasons why the Department of Energy, the NRC, are there with boots on the ground, with detectors on the ground, uh, uh, not only to help assist uh, Japanese power company and the Japanese government, but also uh, for our own sake to know uh, what has really happened directly through our own instruments. But the U.S. government is offering any and all assistance that has been requested. That is correct. Okay. Now, uh, just to touch on Yucca Mountain for a moment, uh, it's my understanding that the Department of Energy or the U.S. government had entered into contracts with the nuclear power plants in the U.S. to take their uh, waste material from uh, the operation of their reactors. And because Yucca Mountain has not been completed, that lawsuits were eventually filed by the industry against the federal government for violation of that contract. I, is, that actually, is that the case? Uh, that is the case. And do you know what the total amount of judgments against the U.S. government is as of today? Um, I don't exactly recall. There have been some judgments. Uh, they're certainly non-trivial. They're uh, 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 considerable amount of funds. These are settlements so that the money could be used by the industry to help store uh, the waste right. on their own sites. Now, I, I don't know if my information is correct, but I've been told it's in the neighborhood of 10 or 12 billion dollars in judgments already. Uh, does that sound in the neighborhood? Uh, I don't know. I, I do remember. It, it, it's certainly over a okay. billion. Is, I don't know where my staff is. But we can well, get we could the follow exact up number. We'll get you the okay. exact number. And I'm assuming that this is an ongoing legal action because of, of Yucca Mountain not being completed. Is that correct? Uh, not specifically Yucca Mountain not being completed. It's a legal action in the sense that we have a responsibility to um, provide for the storage of the nuclear waste. And mm -hmm. as we exceed that, what happens is that uh, and the NRC has determined that dry cast storage at the site right. is, is a safe procedure for at least a half a century, and so, but we right. would be still obligated to reimburse yeah. the companies. Yeah. We, we just don't have the capability to take care of it, right? Right, now. exactly, okay. and, and so that's okay. what we have to do. My, my last question, and this would just not be a question, but ask for information. Would your staff be able to provide me information on the dollar value of loans, loan guarantees, and, and or grants that the Department of Energy may be making for uh, wind and solar projects in the U.S.? Yes, we would be able to, uh, but in the sense of the ones that we've offered conditional commitment right. to or have closed. Yes. Th yes, sir. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you uh, again uh, uh, here. 
before the committee. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get my uh, question about Japan asked uh, and over with the first one, okay? First question I have. Um, as far as security, uh, can you uh, assure uh, the members of this committee, the American public, uh, that what happened in Japan cannot happen here in America at any of our nuclear power points? We are going to be looking very, very closely at the events happening in Japan and take those lessons. And uh, you can be assured that, uh, you know, with the NRC leading, uh, but the uh, Department of Energy providing any assistance to, to look again at the current existing nuclear power plants and any that are being considered for design to look very hard and see uh, how one could, if possible, upgrade the security. We don't believe that there is any danger, but in any incidents like this, when, when there are um, un truly unfortunate uh, events like what we're seeing in Japan, what we do is we look and we learn from that uh, this is true of all the technology, transportation technologies, energy technologies, you name it. And so we will be looking very carefully and gathering whatever lessons that can be learned from that double disaster of the fourth largest earthquake in recorded history uh, and uh, uh, a huge tsunami. And, and so we will take those lessons and apply them to all the, all the nuclear facilities we have in the United States, not only earthquakes, but uh, uh, violent storms. Uh, everything, uh, anything that could affect them. I've, I've been told, uh, Mr. Secretary, that <coughs> uh, as far as natural uh, disasters, uh, that uh, it would be fairly difficult to s have duplicated and repeated what happened in Japan happened here in America, as far as man-made disasters. Uh, and I've been also been told that our number one threat to our nuclear facilities is terrorism. And uh, that, that is really what we should uh, also keep our, a sharp eye on the threats of terrorism uh, to our nuclear facilities. Can you expound on what l uh, the level of activity at the DOE uh, that you have uh, committed and what are, what, are, what are your plans for uh, countering any terroristic attack that might wind up having the same results or even more, diff or well, more uh, different results? Well, all the uh, civilian nuclear facilities are, are tasked of, to have uh, very high security measures. And I can cer per certainly vouch for the uh, Department of Energy nuclear facilities. Uh, they have extraordinarily high security measures. Uh, I would say that rather say whether terrorism or natural disasters is higher or lower, we are, um, and the NRC are very focused on actually preventing either from happening. Okay, uh, I'm gonna shift uh, the direction. Uh, section 1425 of HR1, uh, the Republican proposed continued resolution plan, will rescind 25 billion of the 47 billion in DOE's loan guarantee programs under Title 17, which includes funding for renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. Can you speak on the impact of cutting funds for renewable sources of energy under the DOE loan guarantee pro uh, program? How important is it that we invest in renewable sources of energy? Yes, uh, in our budget request for 2012, we, we asked for those additional funds to help support the 1705 loan guarantees, but also for an expanded authority so we could also invest in energy efficiency technologies as well, because energy not used is, is money saved, energy saved. Mm -hmm. um, if without that uh, additional loan guarantee authority, many of the projects uh, that would also help unleash private capital and bring that off the sidelines, we're afraid would not go forward. And so that would mean uh, that a, a significant decrease in the job creation uh, going forward, that would mean uh, 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 it would it would really set back what we're trying to do, both in in starting our economy and also, quite frankly, in uh, 
having a development source that would give a signal to industries in the united states to be developing these new sources we want to give that signal because it's a competitive world out there and there's going to be a race in who develops these technologies that will be abandoned worldwide thank you and you're back at this time recognize the gentleman from michigan for his question thank you mr chairman i uh... have a number of questions and i'll abide by the five minute rule uh, I must say that I have the same complaint with you as I may have with your predecessors. At least I think I have a complaint with you, and that is from time to time we hear the uh, department give its uh, gas estimates, uh, and when I, at least when I hear them, I wonder if we're not going to hit those estimates by the end of the week and uh, not by Memorial Day. And last week uh, I heard a national report that the department was uh, indicating that it thought that gas prices would be $3.70 by Memorial Day. The particular gas station that I was passing that day going into the office uh, from Northern Virginia was already at $3.89, uh, and it's, it's higher than that in a lot of places around the country. USA Today had a headline, must have been about a month ago, will gas prices hit $5 by the 4th of July? Uh, I look at the projections that the administration has put forth uh, showing, as, as we all know, we get about a third of our oil from the Gulf. We're a quarter of a million barrels less per day uh, than we were getting a number of months ago. And when you looked at the, the time from 09 to 12, again, DOE indicates that we're going to get about 450 million barrels less per day in 12 than we got in 09. Is one that believes in supply and demand. I see Alaska has, you know, continued uh, um, uh, declines in production. Uh, where do you think we really will be? And this was again before Libya, before Egypt, before all the different things that were happening in the Middle East. Where do you really think we're going to be on gas prices? Something that is on every consumer's or every every household's uh, mind uh, across the country. Well. Um there is an official EIA prediction, as you as you mentioned. Um, uh, they must be career bureaucrats. That's what I. I oh, actually, they're, they're there. Whether it's Republican or Democratic administration, it just actually seems that semi, they are wrong. It's, in, it's actually an independent arm, it so, is. So, <laughs> yes. that it's, so that it's independent of any political influence, uh, and and that and that's. But in any case, um, uh, certainly the gas prices in Washington D.C. are higher than the average in the country. The gas prices in California. But I see those same prices in Michigan. They were they're yeah. 380 this week in Michigan. But anyway, going going back to I I don't really know what the gas prices are going to be uh, this summer. Um, the mean projection is 370, as you said. Uh, the large uncertainties. Uh, the AI report. So uh, w we don't really know, um, and uh, it. Uh, I don't have any better crystal ball than you do on, on that. Um, in terms of the uh, oil production in the United States, uh, again, there's first, um, you were talking about the oil production in the Gulf of Mexico uh, and what's going to be projected. And I believe you were talking about uh, this is what was happening uh, because there, in the, there was a suspension for a while of the deep water exploration. Uh, exploration the oil production in the Gulf has continued. The shallow water exploration has continued, but the deep water uh, permitting has begun again. But if you, again, and look at the actual production levels, they're down from the projection from only four or five months ago, and they're down again, according to the your well, own numbers, uh, from the trend line from 09 to 12. In the actual fact, that I don't want to focus just on the Gulf. If you look at the total oil production in the United States, again, there's some uncertainties, but we're actually seeing increased oil production in the continental, continental United States. Uh, and we're actually expecting to see an increase in oil production uh, from fracking of shale rock. And uh, again, it's uncertain how much that will grow, but already it's uh, a couple hundred thousand barrels a day production. It could increase to over a million barrels a day. So, so in the near future. So, so again, we don't know. It's the total oil production in the United States we're also looking at. Let me, in my remaining time, let me ask uh, two questions. Uh, I know you've been in contact with your counterparts in Japan. Um, is there anything that they've asked for that we've not done? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, they have 
accepted our help in terms of uh, the services, the, uh, the airborne radiation detectors, things of that nature. And so um, we are continuing to offer them help and, and they, are, they are accepting it. Yeah, I, I just know too, I know I said million, I meant hundreds of thousands in my, my uh, uh, declining production. Hundreds of uh, thousands of Yeah, I, I said right. 450 million, right. but I, 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 I added understood. three zeros. Yes. Uh, uh, last question in my two seconds is, I just, we, uh, a number of us sent you a letter back in February uh, asking questions about the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. If you could take a look at the letter and give us a response as we get prepared, right. that'd be terrific. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Back my time. This, uh, this time, recognize the gentleman from California for his question, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, after Chernobyl, many said such an event could not happen in the United States because the Soviet Union's nuclear sector was not as advanced as our own. And there was truth to that. The Chernobyl plant was not as advanced and was not designed with many of the safeguards we have in the United States. But Japan is a highly developed country. It is as techno technologically sophisticated as us and there's much concern in the U.S. that a similar accident can occur here. How do you respond to that concern? Well, <clears throat> uh, first I would agree with you. The uh, reactor in Chernobyl was of a different design. It, was, um, it, was, it had points of instability. It had no containment vessel. Um, at, but we are looking very carefully at what is happening in Japan because, as you say, they're uh, using more advanced designs. Um, a number of reactors in the United States with similar designs, um, uh, and we're going to look at what went wrong in terms of this double-barreled whammy of this huge, huge earthquake and then a huge tsunami, and and look to our reactors again and learn as much as we can, so we can, uh, if needed, improve the safety. By if needed, what I really mean is that we're always increasing the safety of our reactors, and not only our reactors, but all the safety of all our industrial systems. And Mr. So Secretary, uh, uh, two days ago, a number of us wrote to Chairman Upton, Whitfield, and Stearns requesting that our committee here investigate and hold hearings about the safety and preparedness of nuclear power plants in the United States. Do you think we should investigate the issues to ensure the safety of our nuclear plants? I think th uh, that will naturally occur, especially given the events in Japan, that w we will look back as we learn what happened and, and apply those lessons uh, were needed to all of our nuclear power reactors, that, that will be a natural consequence. Well, a, a natural consequence for everybody to look at it, but quite frankly, I think we have a responsibility in right. the Congress, uh, not just you in, in your position, but we in the Congress uh, for our oversight and investigative purposes since we write the laws. Now, let me ask you about the laws that we're in the middle of writing. We, we're trying to figure out our energy policy, and the Republican energy policy seems to be depending on coal, oil, and nuclear power. That's what they look to for the future. In fact, it's been the past. And we do have a problem of climate change because of the uh, carbon and other greenhouse gases. We do have a problem now that so much of all of our eggs are in the nuclear basket. When we look at the Republican budget, uh, they they ha are putting in uh, billions of dollars of investment and thousands of construction and permanent jobs are all going to nuclear, but they're rescinding a lot of your budget to deal with other things that are clean and reliable and safe, such as renewable energy and energy efficiency. Just to, to dramatize this issue, the Republicans on this uh, – Republicans would rescind 25 billion of the 47 billion in loan guarantee authority that was provided to you in 2009, but they'd preserve 20.5 billion dollars in loan guarantees for nuclear energy, while leaving only 1.5 billion for all other technologies. They say they're for all all of the above strategy. That's an all nuclear strategy to me. Uh, in, in the time, uh, I'd like to have you explain why it's so important for America to be looking at these other projects as we devise our energy strategy to move us away from dependence on oil, 
and coal and maybe even nuclear uh, for our future. Certainly, uh, if you look at um, what's going to be happening in this century, uh, we believe, for example, that the prospect of solar power coming down in price, uh, the business community thinks that within this decade, the full in costs of solar generation of electricity will be cut in half. Uh, we have had a number of work groups, and we think it's very possible that within, by the end of this, not century, but the end of this decade, excuse me, that it, it perhaps can be cut uh, to 25 percent of what it is today. They'll be competitive if we make investments in them. Uh, it will be very competitive, and realizing that there is a high probability, a reasonable probability that solar energy, other renewable energies, wind, could be competitive with fossil fuel by the end of this decade. But nuclear energy, on the other hand, is not competitive unless the government subsidizes it. The market does not pick nuclear power as a winner if the market works its will by itself. Isn't that correct? W at the moment, I think nuclear and renewables uh, uh, do need help, but, but going forward, w w we're trying to figure out a plan where none of those uh, will, will need subsidy. Gentlemen's time is expiring. This time, recognize the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you. And again, uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. I've got a lot of questions short, and I'm going to try to go not disrespectful, but trying to get through my list. But I'll just say to the Chairman Emeritus, that's why coal will still be king, because it does address the market issues, and coal will still have a major issue in our portfolio for years to come. Um, just an issue, I had a visit by a battery technology guy who said that he was laughed out of their battery office. And my concern is, is that the DOE may be so big and already have a design belief on battery technology that if someone comes with something new, that they're not going to get a, a good hearing. Uh, can we talk about this later on and, and visit with this? Sure. Because that's not, if we're going to do research, we don't want to have, because we've put billions of dollars into one sector, if a new entry comes in that may offer more, we want to give them a fair hearing. Uh, can you define clean? Um, well, we can start with uh, what we all recognize are traditional pollutants, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, mercury, particulate matter. The uh, criteria pollutants in the Clean Air Act. Yes, but also clean also includes carbon dioxide. Okay, and, and uh, that's good because a lot of people will not add that. They'll say clean but they won't address the CO2 issue. And, and just, just a message, uh, Waxman-Markey failed as a, as, a, as a national policy through the legislative process because the public decided to not price carbon. Uh, so uh, I would, we had that argument yesterday. We have a, a bill moving through the floor of the House that uh, will start addressing the EPA, but uh, we need another approach. And I would say energy security is a better way to bring both sides together than uh, pricing carbon. Uh, DOE was established in what, 1977? Around that time, I 75, it, yes. 76. Our reliance on imported crude oil at that time was what percent? Do you have any idea? 70s, I'm going to take a wild stab, something around 25 percent. Yeah, I, I thought maybe 35. Okay. I'm not sure. And what is it today? It's about 50, 51 percent. So can we say that we've really made any great strides by having the DOE, DOE here over 25 years? No, in fact, uh, a little while ago it was uh, close to 60 percent. Thank you. Um, uh, that, that is a point. Uh, future Gen 2.0, is that really Bush Gen 1.0? Future Gen 2.0 is, uh, no. Uh, this is. Uh, let, me, let me explain. I followed Future Gen a lot. Yes. Uh, future Gen was a, a, a new coal fired plant that actually would go to hydrogen technology and a research center. Bush tubed it said, let's gasify coal in existing plants and use CCS. Isn't that what Future Gen 2.0 is? No. Uh, future Gen, the first Future Gen was a gasification and capture and storage. This is- Using hydrogen turbines, though. New technologies. Uh, yes, syngas turbines, most- Okay, so my point is, just for clarity, mm -hmm. when we're, re when we're re re retrofitting Meridosha with current technology, which is gasification, capturing it, that really was the Bush plan. That is really what Bodman was moving to do. Was that correct? Uh, certainly the taking of a commercial scale power plant, capturing the carbon dioxide and sequestering it, was a Bush plan. But this future gen is slightly different because it's burning 
in an oxygen atmosphere thank you i've got i got the answer that i needed the we want to decrease reliance imported crude oil senator obama joined senator bunning to push a coal to liquid legislation through the senate what's the doe's position on coal to liquid technologies we think it's something we should look at uh... there are new coal to liquid technologies i'm not talking about the older ones invented by germany during world war two uh... but new ones were more efficient uh... you we have to capture the carbon dioxide the excess carbon dioxide in those technologies and indeed the national academy of sciences america's energy future has issued a report looking at the mixture of coal plus biomass gasification methods to then create liquids with carbon capture and, and it's my understanding that carbon footprint is actually lower than crude oil refineries in that design uh... significantly lower and once you exceed thirty percent of uh, biomass it actually becomes negative we want to be helpful on that last question is one of the one of the risks in japan is that one one of the decommissioned or offline nuclear power plants had a storage pool that went dry is that correct we don't know uh... at least that's the industry reports are the uh... there are so many conflicting reports let me just let me just make this point and i'll be done there are there are eleven pools within forty miles of downtown chicago wouldn't it make sense to have one center location for storage of high-level nuclear waste like you identified in your report when you were the lab director when you said licensing of Yucca Mountain Repository as a long-range resource was one of the findings. Well, it's talking about two different things. In a nuclear reactor site, immediately after you take out the rods and put them in, uh, you need to put them in water pools. That is a very short-term uh, storage. The Yucca Mountain is a long-term. Uh, the, told, the folks who are holding the, the nuclear waste in pools think it's pretty long-term right now. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, recognize the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, uh, in the line of questioning, uh, we had a lot of questions of you uh, members talking about solar and wind. Uh, does either solar or wind have the potential in the next 10 years of ever becoming a stabilized base load, like coal or nuclear or even natural gas? Um, it depends on the development of energy storage technologies along with that. Uh, you know, you, you know that they're variable, and when the sun stops shining, the wind stops blowing, they're no longer generating electricity. So it would have to be depend on that. Uh, but before that happens, I, I think uh, it can certainly go to a reasonable fraction of our electricity use. Island countries like Ireland are now are 20 percent uh, wind with, uh, coupled with fossil fuel. Is there any country in the world, I know Denmark has led, uh, what is the percentage of, of wind, for example, in uh, Denmark? Uh, it's about a little over 20, 20 25 percent, but there, there it's coupled into a massive grid, and so Ireland is actually a better example because they have to be self-sufficient uh, in, in themselves. In, according with our grids, we have it much more difficult in our own country because Texas is our own, and of course the east and west coast. <clears throat> Let me ask another question, though. The, the administration has proposed repealing numerous subsidies for tax preferences on fossil fuels, one of which has been part of the U.S. Code since 1926, and another created to help U.S. manufacturers maintain and create U.S. jobs. I'm concerned about this uh, because increasing costs for domestic energy industry would jeopardize both some small business jobs but also increase our reliance on uh, foreign sources of energy. Would you agree that increasing costs for domestic production may also impact our ability to address climate change because we fail to provide natural gas, which is cleaner burning, is a bridge, whatever we have, whether it's nuclear or solar or whatever, uh, that, that would to meet our short-term carbon reduction goals that we hope to have uh, while providing affordable and reliable si supplies for energy for American consumers? Well, I would say based on what's been happening in shale gas and the, and the lower gas prices and the anticipation that for the next decade, possibly two decades, natural gas prices will be low, there will be uh, a, a natural move uh, towards gas. But I would also say that I think the utility companies, the power generators are very aware of this, that you still want a diverse set of energy sources. Well, and I know what could hurt us on our natural gas success in our country. We pay actually less uh, 
you know, for MCF than anywhere else in the world almost for natural gas because of our success. But either tax increases or limitation on hydrofracking could eliminate that uh, 100 years of natural gas that we have. So I would caution you. To jumpstart the domestic nuclear energy industry, your budget requests $36 billion in loan guarantees and authority for FY 2012. How many projects do you think we would be able to support with that, even with the, the tragedy that's happened in the last few days? Do you still think we ought to go forward uh, after taking a breath, for example, and saying, okay, what do we need to do different? Do you still think we need to go forward in expansion of nuclear power in our country? Well, uh, first, I agree with you. I think based on the events in Japan, we need to uh, look hard at, at these projects and, and, and guarantee that they can go forward in, in a safe way. Um, the specific question of uh, the $36 billion, we believe, should be able to fund um, something like six to eight projects. Um, the, the loan guarantees could get six to eight uh, projects going, and um, then we believe uh, if they can proceed and be built on time, on schedule, uh, there would be enough confidence that uh, the private sector should be able to pick that up. Okay. Um, in the, the President's State of the Union address, he had a goal of clean energy sources account for 80 percent of American electricity by 2035. Um, if we shut down our expansion of nuclear power like we did after, uh, you know, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, is there any possibility we could even get anywhere near 80 percent from clean burning fuels? It would certainly make it harder. Uh, right now we are 40 percent clean by this rough definition where you account you know, for natural gas, uh, combined cycle natural gas being half, giving half credit. Um, but I think we'll need certainly a large increase in wind and solar. We will need a clean coal. And I, I believe we will need to have some fraction coming from nuclear. Okay. Um, in, I was surprised, and I know the uh, Energy Information Institute, Mr. Chairman, let me just, I was surprised that the, the billions of kilowatt hours that our country generates even compared to what Japan does. Of course, Japan is blessed with a great deal of hydropower that, for example, in my area in Houston, we're flat. We don't, we don't have the option for hydropower like the West Coast can or other areas <coughs> of the world. So we have to look at natural gas and nuclear and coal. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your patience. Yes. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, in light of what's happened in Japan, I would like to um, hear what you believe President Obama's position is now on, on nuclear power generally in the United States. Does he still support uh, a rebirth of uh, nuclear power and construction of new plants? Uh, could you just give us your best estimate of what his position is? I think um, the President and the Administration believe that uh, we have to be looking very, very closely at the events in Japan. As I said before, we um, have to apply whatever lessons that can be and will be learned from what has happened and is happening in Japan. Uh, would those lessons would then be applied to first look at our current existing fleet of reactors to make sure that they can be used safely and also to uh, look at how, uh, as one proceeds forward, that uh, any lessons learned could be applied. Uh, it would be premature to say anything other than uh, we will use this opportunity to learn as best we can uh, and, and consider carefully how to go forward. I'm not sure what you just said. Okay. <laughs> um, Does the President support new nuclear power plant construction in the United States? The, the present budget uh, is, uh, is what it is, and, and we're asking for loan guarantees. Uh, the present budget is also calling for small modular reactors. Uh, that position has not been changed. So that's a yes. That's a yes. Good. That's what I wanted you to say. See, if you just <laughs> said yes, it would been easy. Now, with regards to the loan guarantees that you just, just uh, mentioned, um, given, again, what's happened, do you, do, do you and the President want the Congress to support the full $36 billion that you have put in the President's budget? Yes. Okay. You're learning. <laughs> You're not a Nobel Prize winner for nothing, I guess, huh? <laughs> Okay, this one's going to be a little bit trickier. <laughs> um, 
You're a former director of a national laboratory and, and did an excellent job. I'm a strong supporter of the national laboratories. At one time, I'd hoped to have one in Texas, the Super Collider Laboratory that wasn't funded under President um, Clinton. However, having said that, given what's given the situation of our budget, uh, do you think it might be time to uh, reevaluate the number of national laboratories and perhaps uh, begin to come up with a plan to reorganize and consolidate them? Um, you're right. That's a toughie. Um, I would say that we are looking, I would say before we do that, uh, there's a lot of other things we can do to, to look at how we can get uh, real efficiencies in what we do. Um, even though the President and I firmly believe that the Department of Energy will play a critical role in, in guaranteeing the future prosperity of the United States in its research and development. Uh, we do also recognize that we have to look to gain efficiencies wherever we can and to streamline what we do, knowing that ultimately the money that we give to universities, to national laboratories and, and help research and businesses uh, that's our real job, and the other structures are there to ensure that we do this uh, in the most intelligent way possible and most responsible way possible. So we are going to be working very hard to look at how we can uh, increase in those efficiencies. Well, I um, support the national laboratories, but I do think we ought to begin to reevaluate uh, them in the light of the budget and also the fact that perhaps some of their missions are not quite what they were when they were originally established. My last question, Mr. Secretary, is again something that's of a sensitive nature. Um, we have had repeated uh, security violations uh, at uh, the Sandia National Laboratory in Los Alamos. Uh, there have been a number of investigations, a number of sp special task forces um, trying to, to get control of the security situation in terms of our national secrets in those institutions. Can you elaborate and tell the committee what the status is of trying to uh, make sure that, that those two laboratories are secure in terms of the uh, secrets that we have out there? Uh, I think the Department of Energy takes the security very seriously, not only Los Alamos, Sandia, but also Livermore, the NSA laboratories. There are other laboratories that uh, carry out classified information. Um, and we take those very, very seriously. Um, uh, and I can give you the details. I, I have a slightly different view than you on, on uh, the number of uh, security violations, but every one of them we take seriously, and we'd be glad to brief you and your staff on I that. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, for the courtesy of giving me the time to ask some questions. <coughs> this time, I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your timely testimony. I recently toured the University of California Santa Barbara's Institute for Energy Efficiency, which was named a Frontier Research Center by your department. And I was pleased that you mentioned your support for this program in your testimony. As you know, this center is researching energy savings in photovoltaics and solid state lighting. I'm so impressed by the work of the professors and the students, especially their commitments to the commercialization of new technologies like LEDs. So would you talk for a minute or two about how budget request will support, your budget request will support the administration's effort to get projects from the laboratory and the marketplace with a direct impact on the economy? Certainly. I think uh, the budget request in the Office of Science that uh, is funding the group you're speaking about is precisely the kind of research we will need to keep, ensure that America stays at the forefront uh, in these developing technologies. Uh, it is a very competitive world out there. Currently, the United States does make the best LEDs, uh, but we can easily lose that lead. Uh, Korea, China, Japan, Europe uh, wants to take this away. In the meantime, we're actually trying to recapture the lead in things we have lost. For example, advanced battery technology and what we see coming out of uh, universities and national labs are the next generation of new batteries where I think we can recapture that lead. These are multi-multi-billion dollar markets in the future, and uh, this is, goes to the heart of what the budget request is about, that, that uh, in this very competitive world where all other countries 
and companies are trying to say, we want to own this share. Uh, this is what's going to be at risk. Thank you. I also want to ask you about the state energy program. Decreased support for these programs will limit efficiency aid to small businesses and families as well as to our local governments. As you mentioned earlier, efficiencies will produce major energy and cost savings. That's been clearly demonstrated over time. I've been told that the state energy program has produced cost savings of $300 million annually. It also leverages $10 in private money for every dollar of government money spent. So would you describe now uh, about how the cuts in the state energy program, particularly those proposed in H.R. 1 by the Republican majority, will affect local clean energy initiatives? Would you anticipate job losses from these cuts? And how would these cuts affect small businesses trying to reduce their energy bills, not to mention homeowners and others? Right. Well, uh, well they certainly will have the impacts you, you, you uh, uh, talked about. And, and this is one of these areas where uh, we have to make some tough choices. Um, you know, we had a, a, a very good state energy program in, in the Recovery Act and also the EBCBG, and we will ha have to work with Congress going forward in whatever budgets they do give us and how to apportion what money for between research and development be uh, and, and things like the state energy program. Finally, um, I want to uh, ask you about the innovative approaches to generating electricity from mar marine renewables. And I have a particular company in mind. Right now, the department has planned funding for nine companies with active projects, including a company based in my congressional district called Ecomerit. Um, first, can you please talk to us about the promise of marine renewables, maybe the steps the department is taking to avoid or mitigate environmental impacts in coastal areas? And second, are you concerned that cuts to clean energy programs like this one uh, might uh, uh, slow down the development of uh, renewal, the, the uh, development and deployment yeah. of, of renewal, re marine new renewables. Well, again, the, the, the cuts would uh, definitely affect the research we can uh, fund in, uh, and by re marine, marine renewables, I'm, I think you're referring to kinetic energy type extraction techniques. Uh, there are at least a dozen companies that I know of that are looking into this, both here in the United States and abroad. It's something that uh, is a, a research project, and um, so we don't really know whether it's going to see wide deployment, but it's certainly one of those areas that's tremendous um, energy in, in ocean waves and in ocean currents. And so that's why these companies, and also research at universities, national labs, are looking at this. And the other pieces, uh, the steps that your department is taking to mitigate environmental impacts yes. on coastal areas. Um, well, this <laughs> is all part of the package because we all know that um, whatever form of energy uh, production we use, they could easily have environmental impacts. And you you do this, uh, you know, at the very beginning uh, because in the end, uh, what you want to do is develop a technology that can actually be deployed and would not be. Uh, there would not be strong objections to that deployment. So it is always part of the package, environmental impacts. Thank you. <coughs> this time, uh, Dr. Cassidy of Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm struck that you mentioned the subsidies, the heightened or continued subsidies for wind and solar and other renewables. I'm looking at something from, I think this is from EIA, Energy Information Administration, and it says as of 2007, which I gather is the latest it's available, the subsidy and support per unit of production of solar is $24.34 per megawatt hour, for wind it's $23, for coal it's $0.44, cents, and for natural gas and petroleum liquids it is $0.25. Cents. So given that there's almost a, uh, what, 100 times increased subsidy for solar and wind versus natural gas and petroleum, uh, maybe 80 times for coal, how much subsidy is required for us to take wind and solar up to 25% of our grid? And can we afford that subsidy? Well, <coughs> there are two ways of calculating subsidies. One is by absolute dollar amount, 
and, and another is by fraction of energy produced. I think you were referred to a fraction of energy produced. And doesn't that seem a more reasonable way? Because obviously if something is 90 per 50 per coal is 50 percent of our energy production, to take the absolute number is a little misleading versus that as a percentage of, what, of the energy it actually produces. Well, it really depends um, because if you look at the subsidy of um, oil and gas beginning uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. If, if we just stay on, uh, just because I have limited time, I don't mean to interrupt, and I don't mean to be rude, but just to take um, right now electricity, mm -hmm. because there is a kind of, if you will, lingua franca, which is the megawatt hour mm -hmm. and the subsidies per. So it's $25 roughly for solar and wind, 25 cents for natural gas uh, per megawatt hour. How long can we subsidize solar and wind, and can we afford it if we're going to increase it to 25 percent of our um, of our electrical use? Well, I certainly think that um, uh, wind and solar should not have uh, any longer subsidies than oil and gas, which is about 80 or 90 years. So will it take 80 to 90 years? Uh, my concern is, because obviously others have attempted to do this, yeah. so there's a industry renewable energy magazine, Renewable Power News, which is kind of an advocacy group for renewable power. Spain has clearly attempted this high subsidy market. I'm struck, I'm quoting from an article they wrote, Spain will cut renewable energy subsidies. These have grown exponentially, their use of renewable energy, but it's been associated with an astronomical rise in energy prices, which has equally resulted in heightening inflation and decreasing levels of competitiveness, which is an alarming threat to a feeble economy. So not to put words in your mouth, but are you committing to 80 years of us to follow the path of Ab Spain? Absolutely not. Um, as I said, we are developing plans of what we can do in order to bring the cost of renewables like solar and wind uh, down to the cost of fossil fuel. Uh, and we're talking about a decade, maybe two decades maximum. And so this is we're an accelerated plan because the world is racing ahead. The development and the drop in price of these renewals will be will be very fast. Now, my concern, though, is, is that uh, we're racing ahead, but there's certain laws of physics. Who am I to tell you about laws of physics, huh? But the battery, uh, the battery capability to store huge numbers, millions of electrons, if you will, doesn't really seem that it's ready for commercial use in the next decade. Now, that said, I'm from Louisiana. Our hydropower ability is limited. Clearly, the reason that wind works in Denmark is that they have lots of hydropower, so if the base load goes down from wind, they can ramp up with hydropower. In my state, the peaking plant will be coal or natural gas. You still get carbon emissions, but you get the higher cost of the renewables. This works in hydropower. What do we do elsewhere? Well, we first, um, Denmark has access to other grids. Uh, Denmark itself, I, I don't believe, has hydropower. But n never mind. The Sweden's point is hydropower is what I'm right, referring the, to. Yeah, the point I is that they have access to other sources of energy out outside their own borders. Um, in terms of batteries, what we are seeing, uh, we're, pr we're pretty certain within the next couple of years, the battery storage technology that begins to go to utility scale will be dropping uh, perhaps by 50 percent. But will it be adequate to, say, power Washington, D.C., if we have windmills turning and the wind stops to blow, or the night comes, or the cloudy is day, will it have sufficient capacity to power Washington, D.C.? I think it's going to be taking uh, several decades to transition to renewables at the extent, but to get to 10, 20, 30 percent renewables, uh, you can get to 20 percent renewables, possibly even 30, without energy storage, but energy storage will be an increasingly important part as you go higher than that. Uh, um, I think we're a little circular because obviously the peaking plants will still be necessary, in which case you still have your emissions. I yield back. Right. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee, for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, I was excited about your comments about prospective gains in solar. I just read the other day that Kleiner, per Kleiner Perkins, the folks who started Google, just made a big investment in a group that could, I think, obtain, I think they said, 30 percent efficiency from solar cells. Could you tell us sort of in layman terms to the extent you can why you think we can get these big advances in solar? And what, what do you think realistic projections for those advances are in the decade? Uh, the realistic projections that within a decade are somewhere between a 50 percent drop and a 70 percent drop in the cost, full in cost. That not only is a module, but it, 
it also includes the installation costs, the electronics costs, the full costs. Um, we actually don't know which of the photovoltaic technologies will work because silicon continues to make dramatic strides, especially, and we're especially looking at uh, dramatically changing the cost of the manufacturing of silicon cells. Uh, there's some wonderful ideas out there that uh, are being pursued by companies and by researchers. Uh, there's also a number of thin film technologies. But if you look at these various, and all the companies are looking at each other, um, we also need to increase the efficiency. Silicon is now uh, in the low 20% efficiency. It, we expect it to make claim, uh, climbs in efficiency. Uh, the thin film technologies <coughs> are also beginning to make significant increases. And so there is a, a great deal of excitement. Uh, when I talk to the photovoltaic manufacturers, uh, they're pretty certain that this drop in effect will occur th in this decade. Uh, but we think it can even be better, and, and that's what we're focused on. We'll shoot for that. Um, the Republican budget has proposed a 35 percent cut from last year in the efficiency and renewable energy portfolio, and about half of that degree of cut for nuclear. That just doesn't make any sense to me. We obviously, it would seem to me, want to have a balanced portfolio. We have great strides available in efficiency and renewable. Would you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think um, we, we would like to see uh, research in both, uh, just as we'd like to uh, support the engineering uh, for small modular reactors, the engineering for looking at how we can improve uh, both the safety and the um, uh, productivity of future nuclear power plants. We think in a balanced approach we should be looking at um, renewables as well. Thank you. I want to ask about Yucca Mountain. We have some real uh, issues. My state, we've paid about $300 million, our rate payers, into the nuclear waste fund. There's been about $100 billion spent already on Yucca. We're told that the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste is proposed to be shut down that was responsible for moving forward. In the state of Washington, we have 50 or have had 53 million gallons of radioactive and chemical waste stored in 77 underground tanks. We need a solution. Right now, we don't see a viable proposal by the administration in this regard, and would like to see one in the near future. Could you give us if, if what options you intend to put on the table, uh, because we would like to see Yucca move forward? Well, first, as you well know, um, the waste treatment plant at Hanford has uh, got a lot of attention, a lot of personal attention from me and a lot of personal attention from my Deputy Secretary, Dan Poneman. And we, in fact, put it on the table uh, first um, both the contractor and, and all the people in, in the DOE involved on it. Now we now have eight teams there. We propose to accelerate the budget so that we can drive this project forward so that it will be delivered on time on budget. And that's uh, the first thing, that we get the material from those uh, liquid waste tanks and into a, a much more stable form. And we, we appreciate your work there. There's good work going on there, and we appreciate your leadership. But we are concerned about the right. depository. If you could, if you could sure. uh, address that. Certainly. And so, uh, so the first order of business is, is to stabilize that waste. The second order of business is that um, going forward, w we do need a plan. Um, we, we, I believe we don't really have a coherent plan, but uh, that's the intent of the Blue River Commission, to look at what to do in the future beyond um, beyond what we now have, beyond what the knowledge was when Congress wrote the Nuclear Waste Act of uh, 1982 and modified in 1985. A lot of water has passed under the bridge. Uh, and so that's the charge of that committee. I believe they're going to be coming out with the results in this June. I suspect you know our position, but not only water over the bridge, but there's some radioactive water maybe burning right now, and we do have pools around this country in scores of places mm -hmm. that do present risks, not just financial risks. So we're going to continue to press the administration on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, West Virginia for five minutes, Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there were several, uh, several questions I have with the uh, one was there has been a dialogue from people that have come before you and in, the, in this hearing have called about coal subsidies. Uh, could you provide, I don't expect you to give them to me now, but could you share with us those companies that are being subsidized 
and how that is and that because people seem to be loosely applying their coal subsidies and I've had opportunities to talk to quite a few coal companies and they're not getting any subsidies so I'd be curious if you could share with us uh, any coal subsidies. There's another issue is the SOAP program, the Small Operators Assistance Program. Um, there seems to be some funding difficulties with that and I would appreciate if you would look into that there your department is not freeing up money to the state to reimburse some of the small operators uh, that are producing coal so if you could get back to me on that I would appreciate it also as it relates uh, um, to uh, uh, funding ratios of, of uh, benefit cost benefit ratios for you that it was it was alleged earlier that since you've been funded somewhere in the early 70s um, you've probably received in the neighborhood of maybe $800 billion in, in cost uh, or uh, revenue to operate. And I'm just curious on a cost benefit ratio, if you could share with us sometime, if you could put that from your staff, that what are the benefits that we've received out of that $800 billion? Okay. If, if, you could, if you could just provide something, I don't, I don't want to get into that right now. I'm sure it could, it could go on for some time because I, I've got to assume that it's, I'm hoping that it's a more than a one-to-one -one ratio that we've received, so I'd like to get some idea of where that would be. Um, but more importantly, where I want to spend as much time was talking about with the National Energy Technology Labs that we have in Pennsylvania, Texas, Alaska, Oregon, West Virginia. Um, when I met with them, they indicated that, that uh, and they are the only laboratory for the DOE um, that's owned and operated by the DOE. Uh, according to their literature as well. Um, and, and they're indicating that, that you're proposing, the budget being proposed is going to reduce their expenditure by almost $800 million um, by their own the data that they have. That's, that's very threatening because I, I, I see a paradox with this. Uh, I heard the administration talking about we want to do more research and development in energy but yet the very energy source, the, the laboratory that you all fund is being reduced by $800 million. Uh, there must be a misunderstanding there someplace, either in the administration making that representation or in the data that they have provided in a chart. So if you could provide us something back on that because they're, they're doing some wonderful things there at the NETL and they're trying to build research uh, cooperatives with the universities in, in the area. Um, and for us to cut their expenditures this time is just unconscionable. Um, so, uh, for example, one is uh, with the, the uh, Marcella Shale that we have in Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, and like, they're trying to find ways through NETO of getting more than 15% of the gas out. Right now, that's all they're getting out of Marcella for all that expenditure. Mm -hmm. And they want to spend the money, but yet you cut it. The, the proposed budget is cutting the amount of money that we have for research. Can you share what's the that underlying current? Why are we cutting money in energy research at, at your own facilities? Uh, I'll get back to you on that. I certainly know uh, the Nettle Labs, and um, I'm, uh, we have now a, an excellent laboratory director that I'm very positive about. Uh, and they're made certainly, and I know what they're doing in terms of increased interactions with the university that I'm very positive about. I'm support, I will get back to you on the details of that because there may be a misunderstanding on the, certainly the research that NETL does and does in the universities. Uh, we, we are very positive on that. And I will get back to you. You get back to me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentleman, uh, gentlelady Matsui from uh, California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being with us here today. I applaud your leadership on supporting continued investments in clean energy technology. Um, these investments are critical for uh, the economic growth of my home district in Sacramento. Um, the developing nuclear situation in Japan has captured the attention of the world and certainly of this committee, and my thoughts and prayers are certainly with the people of Japan. Mr. Chairman, when Chairman Whitfield asked, Mr. Secretary, when Chairman Whitfield asked you about the crisis in Japan, he mentioned the International Rating System for Nuclear Accidents. 
and you explained that the situation in Japan is most already worse, already likely worse than that on Three Mile Island. My understanding is that the big difference between Three Mile Island and Chernobyl is that in Three Mile Island, the reactor's containment system was able to contain the radioactive material. So most of that radioactive material didn't spread into the environment. At Chernobyl, there was no containment. So the release of radioactive material devastated the Soviet Union and other countries. Mr. Secretary, what happens if there is a meltdown in one or more of the Japanese reactors and the containment system fails? Well, <coughs> we, we think there is a partial meltdown, but uh, that, and as you correctly noted, that doesn't necessarily mean the containment vessel will fail. Three Mile Island had a partial meltdown and it did not fail. Uh, but we, we are trying to monitor very closely. We hear conflicting reports about exactly what is happening in the several reactors that are now at risk. And um, I, I would not want to speculate in exactly what will happen. Uh, and so let's just say that we monitor very closely uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll take it as it comes. I, I imagine we do not want to go there at all. Uh, we don't want this to become Chernobyl. But, um, I will think that in the light of these events, the committee should investigate the safety and preparedness of our own reactors. And I think you said that also, but I think this committee should really take that seriously because we have an obligation to make sure that our own reactors are safe. Mr. Chairman, my home district of Sacramento, we have a decommissioned nuclear power plant which now manages use the used nuclear fuel. And there are about 10 sites around the country, including Sacramento, where used nuclear fuel is being stored, but where the nuclear power plant has been dismantled. I'm interested in knowing what is being done at DOE to prioritize these sites to move the used fuel so that they can be placed back into productive use. Um, how does your requested budget address these issues? Well, I would have to get back to you on the details of the sites you're speaking about, but, but there are various stages. After you take the fuel rods out of the reactor, immediately you put them in a, in a pool of water uh, for a period of time uh, where they're uh, actually still dissipating a considerable amount of heat. But then after that, the next stage is that you can put them in uh, dry cast storage, which mm -hmm. is much safer, uh, and it's a, uh, Chairman Gas Jasko will be following me, but uh, <laughs> uh, the NRC has uh, recently ruled that uh, storage in, on site of dry cast storage uh, would be uh, a safe interim, by interim, something on a scale of 50 or 60 years, uh, and that gives us time to develop um, a coherent um, integrated strategy on what to do with spent fuel. So we have, a f well, maybe not 50 or 60 years for Rancho Seco, but maybe well, we, we hope to uh, develop a plan <laughs> far sooner than that. Okay, uh, <laughs> great. Um, Mr. Secretary, we're fortunate in the Sacramento region that we have access to clean hydropower resources as part of our growing renewable energy portfolio. I believe we are to achieve the President's goal of establishing a clean energy future. Hydropower needs to be part of the discussion. I'd like to know what DOE is doing to advance the adoption of new hydropower systems to generate more clean electricity in the country. Uh, there's uh, several things we can do. We don't anticipate building new large dams, but we can replace the old turbines in existing dams with more efficient turbines that are actually friendlier to fish mm -hmm. uh, and more efficient. Uh, we should look at what are called run of the river hydro dams. So again, it has um, far less environmental impacts than a, a conventional dam, and we should also look at um, storage of water, sites where we store water for flood control, yes. but then we release the water and uh, to put uh, turbines in those sites again would have uh, virtually no environmental impact, but it's, uh, you can capture the electricity. So those are the, those are the things we are looking at. Okay, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I see my time has run out. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Colorado for five minutes, Mr. Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for uh, your attendance today. A couple of questions for you, uh, following up somewhat on the other members' questions, but also uh, some questions concerning Yucca Mountain. Your 
right now, what is your, and, and also what's happening in Japan, right now, what is your level of communication with uh, the administration in Japan regarding the uh, events? Well, I, I spoke to the METI minister, I think it was a, boy, no, it was yesterday morning, uh, and offered him, uh, him uh, some of our services, our equipment, things like that, which he accepted and expressed gratitude for that. Uh, we are certainly in more than, I don't know whether it's hourly, or, but it's certainly constant contact with, with people in Japan of our people. Uh, there are communications with Ambassador Roos, uh, several daily, uh, and, and so we're mostly going through channels. The State Department is also communicating, uh, NRC, and so there are many, many, and, th and then th th other informal channels. But, but we're, we're continuing to offer assistance to Japan in any way we can, as well as informing ourselves what the situation is. And at this point, you are satisfied with their response to, to the situation? Well. Uh, that I, I can't really say. I, I, I think we hear conflicting reports, but uh, I'll go back to say that Japan is a very advanced country. They they take th these things very seriously, and and uh, and so I don't want to be say anything more than uh, we we will stand by and help them as best we can. Uh, thank you, and Mr. Secretary, uh, do you believe uh, I've seen various what appear to be conflicting statements regarding the use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in news reports? Uh, do you or do you not support, at this point, access of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Well, if by access you mean that uh, using th regarding the Strategic Petroleum Reserve as uh, one of several options that we can, we can hold uh, in our arsenal, um, it is designed for uh, severe disruptions in supply. The President has made it very clear that that is an option that he, he can consider. Um, and th there are other there are other things that are happening right now. I think the uh, other oil producing countries in the world are stepping up their production. What about production here? Have you talked to Secretary Salazar or perhaps the Department of Agriculture about stepping up production uh, with our, within our own resources? I think the, uh, that's right. I, we, Secretary Salazar is, uh, as I understand it is now, um, two deep water leases have been recently issued. There have been uh, a number of shallow water uh, leases that have been um, issued. There is an increase in production in the continental United States, as I mentioned before, because of um, the shale gas actually has shale oil in it as well, and and uh, people are beginning to, we see an increase in recovery of that, and that's going to be a significant asset going are forward. You, are you encouraging uh, domestic production uh, to help lower the price of, of uh, I think, I think, uh, I think uh, domestic production is, should be part of a coherent plan going forward and what we need to do with our transportation fuel. But what is the President's plan right now to lower gas prices by the summer? Well, um, it's, first it's, it's uh, we won't, domestic production itself doesn't turn on instantly. Even if you have uh, a known reserve, uh, producing more production from that known reserve will actually take months to years. Uh, developing new reserves would take longer. But the fact that that's coming online should be reflected that, in price. That is true. So the immediate thing was, is that if you know that there are reserves coming online, just as uh, oil producing exporting countries around the world, you know that they're increasing their production, so that sh should have a calming influence on price. But in the long run, I think it, it, we should also say that if you look at the demand, by the long run, I mean, can, can Plus years. So the administration's plan to lower gas prices by the summer is 10 to 12 years? No, we are we're working towards doing what we can in the short term, but I'm also saying that uh, this problem can emerge easily again because of the laws of supply and demand. So what, what is the administration's plan, though, by the summer to lower the price of gas? Well, it's, uh, it's we're going to be seeing if it production can be increased. We're, we're uh, in conversations with other countries around the world on how we can increase production. And again, uh, strategic petroleum reserve option is on the table. So, but you are talking to the Secretary of Interior and Agriculture, uh, Department of Agriculture, to increase production here? Well, I, I talk to the Secretary of Agriculture and Interior uh, several times a week. Um, but. Uh, I think the licensing and, and things of that nature are in the purview of uh, Secretary Salazar, and it's in good hands. 
And thank you. And I have additional questions on uh, Yucca Mountain that I'd like to submit if you wouldn't mind giving sure. them back to the record. Thank you. Uh, this time the chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan uh, for five minutes. Curtis, I thank you for holding the hearing and for your courtesy in recognizing me. Mr. Secretary, welcome to the committee. Uh, the President in his State of the Union says that if the United States is to compete, we intend to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. A big part of that, from my perspective, is the Section 136 program, or the Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Loan Program. I've heard from numerous entities that have applied for funding under Section 136. And I find that in the development of that, none of them have been able to tell me that it has been an entirely positive experience, although I believe you and the department have tried to be as helpful as you can. It is, of course, a complicated and a new law, which is somewhat uh, made difficult by the fact that you have to had to function under very, very limited time frames. In fact, I hear uh, a complaint that the goalposts are constantly moving. This is very, this is a is perhaps the most serious, and it is perhaps the one that I hear most. Companies feel that everybody enters into negotiations with the best of intentions, but they have no assurance that they will ever get to the end of the road. For the record, please, would you provide a detailed summary of how Section 136 process works. Mr. Secretary, I note that your budget request for this year is 40% less than was requested in 2011, and that the 2011 request is 50% less than the 2010 enacted levels. I understand our budget situation is serious, but this seems to be inconsistent with the President's out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build message. Has the need for funding to re-equip, expand, and build more facilities to create the vehicles of the future gone down since 2010? Yes or no? No, we, we certainly need to uh, expand and bid, build facilities. Were you re uh, comparing the recovery budget or our base budget? Uh, well, my, my concern here is uh, the Section 136 process and how it's working. And what I'm finding, what I'm trying to find out is, has the need for that section to be used for funding to re-equip, expand, and build more facilities to create the vehicles of the future gone down since 2010 so as to justify the reduction in the level of funding requested by the administration, yes or no? I think you're uh, it's gone down if you're including Recovery Act funding. Say again? I said if you're referring to the ATVM loans and uh, including the Recovery Act funding for 2010, mm -hmm. are then, and that's, if you do that, if you include that, our funding request has gone down. Well, I'll, I'll, I, I think it would be helpful to both of us if you were to submit the answers to the record. But it, I am, what I'm concerned is that uh, we up there, find that there is still a substantial need, and yet we are finding that the requests for funding are going down. And, and I, what I'm soliciting, Mr. Secretary, is your comments on this matter. Last question, Mr. Secretary. Could you, for the record, submit a comprehensive list of applicants for assistance under Section 136 and uh, give us each, uh, with regard to each, uh, an indication of where they are in the process. I think, um, I think the applicant, uh, I don't think we're really, we'd be violating some uh, confidentiality in the applicants of who, who's applied, uh, and so uh, that would be difficult. Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, I am not trying to lay any traps for you, and, and, and I recognize this is difficult, which is why I ask that uh, you submit this for the record. And my staff will be happy to work with your staff to see to it that uh, we are able to work together to get the proper answers. We, 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 can, we can supply information in the aggregate and anonymity, things of that nature, and we, we, we can do that. 
And I hope you understand, Mr. Secretary, these are friendly questions, not okay. hostile. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. Uh, thank you. At this time, I recognize for five minutes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary Chu, for your testimony today. Uh, in light of your opening statement, uh, I believe, if I can paraphrase it, you said nuclear power should continue to be a key part of our national energy policy. Is that correct? That is correct. We would like to be uh, a part of our uh, energy in this century, yes. Uh, in light of this, the administration has eliminated the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management, uh, an office within DOE expressly created by statute. The administration has also shut down the Yucca Mountain Repository Program. There are currently concerns about the status of spent nuclear fuel rods that have been in wet storage at the Japanese nuclear plant affected by the recent er earthquake. In light of the events in Japan, does the decision to eliminate the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste and the shutdown of Yucca Mountain program deserve reconsideration from the President? Well, again, we're, we shouldn't conflate what is happening with the uh, events in Japan and the um, need to have a long-term repository. Again, as I said, there are, there are stages once the fuel rods have been used and they're stored in a pool, but that's a, that's a very short-term thing, and then you convert after, after several years to dry cast storage. Uh, and then finally, um, you, you look for disposition, um, but technology is changing, and there's, um, again, I don't want to preempt what the Blue Ribbon Commission will say, but, but there are other, there could be potentially, going forward in the coming years, other opportunities to per perhaps capture um, more of the energy content of that uh, used fuel. So at present, how does the administration uh, fulfill its obligations under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to manage and permanently dispose of the nation's spent fuel inventories? Pardon? How do you, how do you manage and permanently dispose of the nation's spent fuel inventories today? Well, we... Um, we are, the Department of Energy is responsible for uh, dealing with the spent fuel, and again, we, we're asking the Blue Ribbon Commission to, to give us advice on, uh, which they will do in June as in, in a draft report, on uh, how to proceed forward so that we can actually uh, take this spent fuel. Uh, as I said, I don't want to preempt what they're saying, but uh, so I don't really know what they're going to be recommending in terms of what you use with the fuel once it's cycled once. In, in light of the events in Japan, can you make any conclusions at this point about the safety of nuclear power uh, in the United States as a result of what you know about the incident? Um, no, I, th I think we're, what we, as I said before, what we want to do is look at what happened in Japan uh, and say if there are these multiple events as was happened in Japan, you know, uh, a, a terrible earthquake and a tsunami, and look to whether we would be more vulnerable to uh, a cascade of multiple events and how they might compromise safety. And so we, we first intend to look fully at um, whether we have considered all possibilities and, and get whatever lessons we can learn from. What is DOE doing in terms of monitoring any potential radiation emitted from the Japanese facility? Will you collect uh, exposure and health effect data? Well, what we have done is we've uh, airlifted uh, uh, airborne equipment that can, that can help monitor, uh, made that available to the Japanese. We also have ground equipment so that uh, can pick up uh, s uh, exposure levels and the type of radiation of, of people on the ground that we've also uh, in, in the process. So it's in Japan now, and we're looking to, we, to deploy that in various areas so that we can have a a first-hand understanding of what the exposure levels are and how they might change. In your testimony, you say uh, we are cutting back in multiple areas, including eliminating unnecessary fossil fuel subsidies, reducing funding for the fossil energy program, and reducing funding for the hydrogen technology program. Will this decision increase or decrease uh, gas prices, in your opinion? Well, I think the fossil fuel program, it was most, mostly a, a, 
well, let me back off and say that because of the Recovery Act, there was uh, a tremendous amount of investments in clean coal technologies, carbon capture sequestration technologies. And so because of that, we felt that uh, given that uh, essentially $4 billion in, uh, of investments uh, that we can, and given the uh, issues about the fiscal responsibility, we thought that uh, that very large investment can carry us forward for a number of years. So that's where most of the uh, investments in our fossil energy program were going into. Uh, it was in going into clean coal technologies. We will still continue to make those investments because we believe that is a proper government role to develop clean coal technologies. Um, but that is different than <coughs> uh, transportation fuel. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Chu, you wear many hats as the Secretary of Energy. One of them is banker-in-chief to the nuclear industry, uh, a socialist system that allows for the U.S. government to provide taxpayer-backed pa uh, loan guarantees for nuclear power plant construction in our country. Uh, I, I want to know from a purely financial risk perspective, do you think that the events in Japan uh, will probably make it less likely for Wall Street investors or utility executives to want to assume the financial risks associated with ordering a new nuclear power plant? I can't really predict what Wall Street will do, but certainly the events in Japan uh, will um, uh, are going to cause everybody to look back and look back to their existing plants and, and their future plans. Uh, and uh, and I think uh, that's a good thing in the sense that uh, you take this opportunity to look back and see what you're doing and, and are you doing everything possible to, to maximize the safety. Just so along uh, those lines, are you going to reassess as the banker in chief the risk premium that you charge nuclear utilities for the loan guarantees you're giving them in light of the events in Japan? That is, the risk premium is uh, ultimately a credit subsidy issue. Uh, Are you going to re-examine it in light of what happened in Japan? Well, I think all factors get folded into uh, a nuclear loan. So you are going to re-examine it? Yeah, it, but ultimately, as you know, um, the uh, OMB is the, uh, agency, the part of the government responsible for the determination of that credit risk. Should OMB uh, re-examine the, uh, the risk premium? I think they will include anything like uh, what has happened in Japan in their determination. So this should go back again. Th uh, I thank you. The department has awarded an $8.3 billion loan guarantee to the Southern Company, conditional upon the certification of the brand new design, uh, the AP-1000 reactor uh, uh, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Three days before the Japanese earthquake, I sent a letter to the NRC because I learned that one of its most senior scientists, Dr. John Ma, has said that the design of that plant may be too brittle to withstand a strong earthquake and that it will, quote, shatter like a glass cup under strong impact. He even said that Westinghouse modeled the resiliency of the reactor using a totally unrealistic earthquake simulation. Don't you think it's too risky to issue conditional loan guarantees backed by the federal ta taxpayer for reactors like the AP-1000 that have not been fully approved by the NRC in final form uh, after public notice and comment, particularly when one of the NRC's own top technical people has raised serious concerns about its safety. One of the uh, conditions of a loan is that the NRC has to grant approval of um, the license, and, um, and that is still pending for the NRC. And so the Southern Company and its collaborators do not get federal money until the NRC approves their construction. Uh, don't you think that we should hold off on licensing new reactors or new reactor designs or approving new um, loan guarantees until we are sure that these new reactors are safe and we've learned the lessons of Fukushima? I think uh, we will, no matter what happens go going forward, uh, try to take the lessons of Fukushima and apply them to our existing fleet and, and any future reactors that we will be building. Now, in the case of the conditional loan guarantee you gave the Southern Company for the two new AP-1000 uh, nuclear reactors at Vogel, 
that eight point three billion dollar loan taxpayer loan guarantee will then allow the southern company to get an eight point three billion dollars loan directly from the federal financing bank at the department of treasury again and u s taxpayers so the taxpayers are fully on the hook for eight point three billion out of the fourteen billion dollar project if there is a default on this vogel plan and the first two units that they have already built in past years there were eleven times over budget so if there's a default on the vogel loan what would happen in our loan guarantee program the people who work in that program will be very very hard so that they make sure that if there is a default that the government taxpayers are protected that there are assets in in the southern company and others but if you can't get paid off what happens then well there are it's a very complex agreement and there are specific we own the southern company like we involuntarily wound up owning general motors if they can't pay that i would have to get back to you in the details of what the exact recovery is i think the american taxpayer really has to be protected here going forward gentleman's time has expired not be licensing ap one the gentleman from mississippi mr harper is recognized for five minutes thank you mr chairman thank you secretary to for being here today i know that you can see the uh... the end in sight here of the questioning i know you'll uh... appreciate your time though today being here and i wanted to talk to you about uh... something that president obama said in a press conference recently uh, that we should increase energy production in this country, and he mentioned oil specifically. Uh, but it appears in his two plus years in office, uh, I would argue the president has really not done much in that uh, way, uh, not much towards increasing our production of oil. Uh, when the president uh, came into office, gas at the pump was actually uh, under two dollars a gallon. We're approaching four dollars a gallon in many uh, regions. Uh, and, of course, we've uh, had the Deepwater Horizon explosion back on, uh, I believe it was April 20th, uh, approaching that one-year anniversary. And then a moratorium was placed on the Deepwater offshore drilling in the, in the Gulf of Mexico following that. And there have been limiting of leases on the East Coast. And, of course, uh, we continue to ignore our resources in Anwar. And I'd ask if you've had any conversations with the president recently about expanding exploration and production of domestic oil, and if you've had those conversations, what uh, what input or direction have you received from the president? Um, first, the president has already spoken on this matter. He mentioned in a press conference that in 2010, the production of oil in the United States was as high as it's ever been since 2003. Uh, prior to the Macondo accident, what had happened is more land uh, was made open to have access to drilling, and that was, uh, that was certainly an administration policy. Uh, the oil companies are sitting on a lot of on leases still for not fully uh, utilized, and the President has said that uh, they would ask the, if those companies are just sitting on those leases and not actually using them, mm -hmm. that w we can explore mechanisms to find other leases who would then explore those. So, so the President is, uh, as part of a comprehensive transportation strategy going forward, that's one of the things in order to, to deal with um, what we're now facing. When we say, or when the President says, or, or the White House says that uh, the production is as high as it's been since 2003, uh, is that high enough in light of what's going on around the world, in, uh, first with the concerns in Egypt and then Libya, and now uh, what's happened in Japan? Uh, are, you, are you convinced that uh, we're, we're pursuing uh, the recovery of our own natural resources as it comes to oil in this country and the regions that we can go into uh, offshore, uh, do you believe we're doing a sufficient amount at this level? I think um, we're going to have to do many things. O increased oil production is only part of the, the solution. Uh, as the President said, we uh, now have 2 percent of the known oil reserves in the world, and yet we consume 25 percent of the oil. And so we can increase production in the United States, but it's, it clearly can't be the full solution. That's why we're focused on improving still further energy efficiency in automobiles, biofuels, advanced biofuels especially, and finally electrification. Uh, Secretary Chu, have you had any conversations with the Department of Interior about the slowness in the permits being approved for the uh, Gulf, Gulf of Mexico? No, I haven't. Okay. Do you intend to have any 
uh, about the slowness of the permit process? Well, I, I believe that um, this has gotten started again, and um, the uh, the shallow water permits that was were continuing, and now now we have two deep water permits, and and uh, I anticipate that that will be accelerated. And what is your position on uh, drilling in Anwar? Uh, right now, there are many other sites open for drilling, and uh, so we need not tap there because, and the president is also exploring other sites in Alaska, both on and offshore. And so, at the present time, uh, there are many sites open. For for drilling that are not being used. And so I think we first look to those sites and, and try to get the oil companies interested. Would you look to those sites being used first before you tap into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Well, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, again, is something which was meant to have the continued oil supplies in case of significant disruption. Uh, and that's a tr strategic reserve. I mean, oil is a very essential for our country, the, and, and so that's the original intent. What you're speaking of uh, are things that have, um, it takes, even in a known reserve, it takes a year or two to bring up production, and then for unknown reserves and exploration, sure. five plus years. And, and exactly, wouldn't it be necessary, I will yield back my time with that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harvard. This time, recognize the gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Begat. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming today, Mr. Secretary. Um, Mr. Upton said that we're going to have more hearings about what happened with the um, nuclear power plants in Japan. And, uh, but I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions that have been on my mind since the terrible events of last week. Um, the 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 Fukushima Daiichi plant. Um, at, at that plant, three of the six reactors were operating at the time of the earthquake, to my understanding. Is that correct? That is my understanding also. Okay. And so when the earthquake struck, the control rods essentially shut down those reactors as it was designed to do if there was an earthquake. Is that also right? That's my understanding. And then um, after, after the reactors were shut down, then power, power was lost in the plant, and then the cooling pumps were shut off. Is that correct? That's correct. The power so, was lost. So then the backup diesel generators came on, as that was also designed to do. And, and then those generators quit functioning because they went under the floodwaters from the tsunami. Is that right, to your um, best of your knowledge? The generators came on, uh, then later, uh, I've been informed that uh, some of them then shut off. Uh, it had more, I, this is where I, I couldn't um, give assurances because you hear conflicting reports, but the, the story I heard was that the cooling for the generators uh, was at risk and they, they, they tripped off for that reason. Right, okay. So then now what they're trying to do is pump the seawater in to keep these, these rods from uh, melting down, right? That's correct. They're okay. using now fire trucks. So, so um, Another this is the concern I've got, and I, I imagine you share this concern, is that um, there were numerous fail-safe systems here with, the, with this plant. Um, it was a, a pretty, I mean, it's 40 years old, but it's a pretty technologically advanced plant, and there were numerous fail-safe methods, correct? Yes. And, but then, because of the tsunami, uh, the plant was built for er to withstand earthquakes, but because of the tsunami, now we've got this crisis about what to do. And the thing I'm concerned about is that you can't always plan for every exigency in these situations. We saw this on this committee, you saw it last year, with the Deepwater Horizon disaster, because there were numerous fail-safe mechanisms on that rig, and then each one of them failed, and then we saw huge amounts of oil spewing out into the Gulf. So here's my question for you is I know DOE is putting resources towards advanced reactor technology and there are a lot of concerns um, from this committee and from a lot of col my colleagues who live in some in California and some of the other earthquake zones but 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 here's my question is how can you ever have enough with, with, with something so potentially destructive as these nuclear rods, how can we ever anticipate the worst, 
so that we could be prepared for it? That's a tough question, I know, but maybe you have some initial thoughts on it. Well, what, what the Department of Energy is uh, very interested in doing is developing tools to, to get a better handle on, on these multiple cascading events, interacting events, uh, an earthquake plus a tsunami, a tornado plus this or that, things like that. One of the things that we're very keen on doing is because we have developed uh, high-performance computers and simulation techniques that this is one of the tools we think that can actually be used to make any system we have, including nuclear reactors, safer. Uh, you know, there are, if you consider all the, all the things we do now, we, we fly on airplanes, we, we, we do all sorts of things, and, and there's ever-increasing uh, ability to uh, make each of these systems safer as we go forward. Sure. Well, you know, one thing that strikes me, and I've spent, I was just in Japan a couple of weeks ago with a congressional delegation, and one thing that strikes you about Japan, this is not, you know, Chernobyl. This is not some third world country with rinky-dink technology. This is, this is a, the state-of-the-art technology, and yet it failed. So I, I really think one of the questions, Mr. Chairman, we're going to want to explore as we move further is do we really have uh, the kinds of modeling that we need to ha develop nuclear energy safely in this country. And I'm sure you're looking at that, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I think um, the Secretary will agree that the statement that um, Japan will stay the art is inappropriate. It, um, it is a state that was designed maybe 40 years ago. We have now got designs, even in the fuel composition, that really address these issues. So I, as somebody who lives downwind of San Onofre, um, I just want to assure everybody, our surge wall is three times what they had in Japan. The surge wall, the, the construction at Diablo is eight times higher, and the fault line is inland, not offshore. So I think when we talk about this, there are differences scientifically. Let me just say, um, Secretary, I am one guy sitting on this side of the aisle that is very excited to see you as the secretary, and we talked about this last year over the science committee. Um, awesome. Back when I was at, you just realized the connection. Back when I was a young 26-year-old city councilman, the Department of Energy was created. Back in, um, in uh, the um, 70s, when it was created, our dependency on imported energy was what again? Well, I uh, heard uh, 35. I was guessing 25. But okay, I, I think you. I think you're right. I think it was more like 25. But um, and when you took over in 08, the imported energy was what percentage? In 08, uh, probably 60, 59, 60. Yeah, and that's how much uh, success our Department of Energy has had in the past. But that's why I'm optimistic that you're the right guy at the right time with the right president to finally get this country to rather than having an anti-energy policy, actually have an energy policy. And that's one of the one of the things I'm really encouraged about. My biggest concern, and I'll say this with tongue in cheek, is the fact of how much obstructionists always seem to be there every time you come up with an innovative approach. I want to point out that um, as one of the three California surfers in Congress, you mess with our ways to try to generate electricity, you're going to have a real problem with us, okay? I just The fact is, every time somebody says there's something with no, nobody will complain about, believe me, you start talking about wave actions in, Ca in Southern California, Hawaii, we're going to have some concerns. But that aside is that um, one of the things I want to talk about is you're being asked to do things in isolation. And I may disagree. My attitude about our oil reserves uh, or, or the, the areas being drilled is that right now we are, we are buying oil overseas, sending our resources overseas. Um, what happens to the federal profits of, that we get from opening up lands like Anwar or Alaska, where does those, well, we do make some profits off of those, those uh, oil exploration and, and development, don't we? We do. And where does that resource go now? As far as I know, it goes to the Treasury. Okay. Uh, don't you think that we may want to at least discuss the possibility of opening up lands and committing those profits to next generation green fuels so that we have a built-in um, resource like the, the transportation compo components, the freeway interstate system, have a built-in source for you to use to be able to pay for that bridge to a greener future. I would love the Department of Energy to have a built-in source that we can uh, uh, do the research that will lead to technology the private sector will pick up. Okay, let's talk about obstructionists. 
We talk about going to electrical generation. We talk about energy development. Isn't it true that the technology we use for efficient electric motors and the, the efficient um, generation of, of wind power depends on permanent magnet technology because it's so much more efficient than the AC technology that it, that it replaced? The permanent magnet technology is more efficient, and we're also looking at other, uh, because these permanent magnets and their rare earth magnets. This is where we come down, the rare earth. At the same time we're talking about electrification, nobody in this town is talking to the Department of Interior about opening up public lands to allow the mining of rare earth, 70 pounds in every, every Prius, where in the 30 years that we have gone with this energy department, they, the Department of Interior has created an environment where instead of 98 percent of the rare earth being produced in the United States, it's now in China. Don't you agree that we need in this committee, if we want to create efficient electrical generation and use, we've got to be brave enough to ask our colleagues over at the Department of Interior and the, the uh, Resource Committee to start looking at opening up public lands within our country so these, these essential rare earth can be developed if we're going to go to electrification. I, I agree with you that um, um, having China control 90, 99 percent of the rare earths of the world is not a good situation. And, and um, uh, we are looking, uh, I believe Molly Corp Corporation in California will be, or I think it's in California, will be. My, my point, Mr. Not sure, actually. Mr. Doctor, is that you understand the barriers. My frustration is the barriers is more government obstructionism. We write checks quick, but we're not willing to change regs. We talk about we need a Manhattan Project for energy independence. The fact is today the Manhattan Project would not be legal to perform under federal and state regulations. And we've got to be willing to not just tell other people how they have to change their operation the way we do business. Those of us in government have to change the way we do business too. Wouldn't you agree? I think we're going to be looking at uh, many, many things that in order, to, but, but uh, certainly uh, NEPA requirements are something we also have to take seriously, uh, and uh, I'd be glad to talk to you uh, about that in private. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doerr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a pleasure to have you here before our committee today. Uh, Secretary Chu, you know in Pittsburgh we're fortunate to have the National Energy Technology Lab that does a lot of innovative research. Uh, and I was hoping I could ask you a few questions concerning some of the cuts in the administration's uh, upcoming budget proposal. I, I see that you've terminated uh, all of the natural gas and oil programs run out of the NETL. Uh, don't you view these research programs as being particularly relevant today since it funds environmental protection projects that are related to drilling, hydraulic fracturing, oil and gas production, as well as the development of advanced technologies that will allow increased recovery from our domestic unconventional oil and gas resources? Well, I think uh, the Department of Energy played a very important role in the developing of natural gas recovery in the late 70s, early 80s to 1992. Uh, it was actually the agency that funded the research that led to the fracking of natural gas, but the private sector has picked it up and is doing quite well. Uh, there has been a transfer of funds uh, from uh, federal uh, FE uh, fossil energy to the Office of Science uh, for doing research in methane hydrate recovery is saying, is saying because the commercial entities are not um, that interested in it so far, but, uh, but the bulk of our funding in FE, as you know, is, is for carbon capture and sequestration. Mm -hmm. but, but, uh, and I understand the larger companies have the ability to pick up some of that slack, but but the, you know, it, this program, uh, at least in my view, uh, is really not subsidizing the bigger companies. In the United States, we have 5,000 small independent producers. They do 90 percent of the wells and 60 percent of the domestic oil and 80 percent of the natural gas comes from these small companies that employ an average of, of 12 people or less. And they don't have the resources to invest in the R&D. And, and, and this is where DOD has really fulfilled a critical need for technology advancements through partnerships with companies like these and university researchers and technology. Um, I, I do want to ask also to follow up because you just mentioned this, the administration's proposed that the gas hydrate, uh, hydrate research program in fossil energy is being terminated and transferred uh, responsibility for future research over to the department's office of science. Now, the program has been well managed. It's made sig significant progress, and, and uh, it concerns me that you're going to kill a program that's on the verge of making uh, production from gas hydrate a practical reality after s decades of research and millions of dollars spent by DOE and other agencies to bring this to this point, 
uh, that you're going to start up a new program in the Office of Science that, that I think would have little bearing on anything. And when you look at the uh, language just in, in the uh, most recent Senate uh, Energy and Water Senate report, um, we contain language about this that, that the committee recommended uh, includes 22 million, and of this amount, 15 million is provided for methane hydrate activities. The committee actually restored this hydrates technology program to the account, and they don't support funding this within the Office of Science. Their intention was that this was to be funded out of uh, fossil energy. So I'm, I'm curious why you're, you're, you're deciding to defund this program and transfer it over to the Office of Science. Well, I know the program very well, and we'll certainly abide by, uh, and, and I do think highly of it. Uh, we hope the Office of Science will look to the people doing that research, but uh, we'll abide by uh, Congress's wishes. Thank you. Uh, one more question, too. Uh, as the co-chair of the House Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Caucus, uh, I'm also concerned about the departments uh, eliminating, uh, basically zeroing out funding for the fuel cell energy program within uh, the Office of Fossil Energy. I understand that one of the projects managed by DOE won an R&D 100 award in 2010 for improving the service life of solid oxide fuel cell stack materials. I'm curious, why would you eliminate this very successful fossil energy program that's developing fuel cell technology required for large-scale power generation applications to produce affordable, efficient, and environmentally friendly electricity from coal? Well, we actually have um, several uh, fuel cell uh, programs within the Department of Energy, and we were consolidating, consolidating them. Um, uh, we are continuing to fund fuel cell development in stationary fuel cells, and so uh, it, was, it was moved out of uh, fossil energy. See, my, my understanding is that you're continuing to fund uh, transportation fuel cells, but, but uh, that you've zeroed out the stationary fuel cells. I think Are we're you saying that's not accurate? Uh, it's my understanding that we're mostly concentrating on stationary fuel cells. Huh. Uh, we do have some on, on transportation, but it's concentrating on that. Thank you. I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, at this time, then, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, continuing uh, talking about coal a little bit, I'm concerned that new regulations will slow growth and send jobs to China. Both you and the President are supporters of China's energy policy. We hear time and time again from the administration that China has strong commitment to wind and solar energy and that we need to catch up or we will lose the f future. But you would agree and are aware that uh, China gets 70 percent of its total energy and 80 percent of its electricity from coal. Wouldn't you agree with that? I've heard numbers like that, yes. Yes, sir. And isn't it true that the United States or that China uses 3.5 times as much coal as the United States uses and that that number is actually growing? Uh, I, I think so. Again, I, I'm not <coughs> sure the exact numbers. Okay. And uh, you are aware that under the Kyoto Protocol, China has no obligation to reduce emissions and is not imposing anything anywhere cl close to the EPA's greenhouse gas regulations on its coal use. Isn't that correct? That is correct. And you're also aware that the Chinese government has repeatedly stated that they would never put a price on carbon. Isn't that also true? Um, I don't know. China is committed uh, very emphatically to transition to tw uh, 15 percent uh, renewable energy by 2020, and they may get to 20 percent. Okay. And uh, while you're aware that wind and solar in, in China are growing in percentage terms, they, they will never or at least not in any time in, in the near future, uh, be equal to uh, their relationship or their reliance on coal. Isn't that true? Well, it's their intention to um, greatly diversify their energy supplies. They're, in the short term, they are heavily dependent on coal, but they've made it very clear that they want to develop wind, solar, hydro, nuclear. Yeah, and um, it, the, um, the factories that make the wind turbines and solar panels for export to the Europe and the U.S., isn't it true that they are actually powered by, by coal energy sources? I would presume, given that uh, coal is still the dominant form of energy. And don't you think that's a part of their competitive advantage, that, that they are using a cheap source of, of fuel uh, that we seem to not want to use in this country? Well, it's, it's um, more complicated than that. Um, I think, um, uh, <laughs> if you don't, 
mind, I'd tell you a little story. I toured a Chinese solar uh, company, uh, and they were, um, they would get their silicon from uh, companies in the United States uh, and, and then add the high value uh, part of it to make the modules in China. And I, and, I, and I appreciate that. My concern is I only get a certain number of minutes to ask you questions, and I guess my concern is, is that, you know, it appears to many that the future of coal in the United States is merely to mine it and send it to China for them to use, and that our jobs are going to go over there. They're going to send their pollution back to us over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, because they're not going to have e even some of the more reasonable regulations that we have, but that we're not using uh, our own coal for our, our manufacturing purposes. And so as a part of that, I'm wondering if you have talked to uh, any of the folks at the EPA about their slowness to permit new coal mining, or is this part of an administration uh, plan to slow down the production of coal and thus force us to, I think, lose jobs, but the plan would be to force us to not use coal because there isn't a supply available uh, domestically. I have not uh, talked to the EPA regarding this, but um, just to finish that story, um, China it takes its silicon from the United States because they says that sil uh, energy is so cheap in the United States and that's why we do it. Okay. And, and in regard to uh, coal, you would agree that it's a fairly uh, affordable and reliable source of energy in the United States and that uh, it's a good source, at least over the next 20 or 30 years, it's a good source that we shouldn't cripple. Would you not agree? Well, I think that's why the Department of Energy is committed to developing those technologies to use coal uh, as cleanly as possible. And I would encourage you to work with the uh, Environmental Protection Agency to make sure that they don't shut down your supply for those purposes and other purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I uh, recognize the gentleman from uh, Ohio, no, from Texas, uh, Mr. Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Chu, and I appreciate you being here. Certainly appreciate uh, how generous you've been with your time over the past two years to uh, visit with members of the committee off uh, outside of the committee room. In response to a question from the gentleman from Mississippi about ANWR and whether or not the president would consider that, you said there were other sites in Alaska that the president was looking at. Now, in all honesty, I mean, his background is a community organizer. You're the energy expert. Are you helping him with that? <clears throat> well, it's actually the, um, this is in the, uh, the domain of the Secretary of Interior. And so um, it's the Secretary of Interior who would be helping him with that. All right, but he's got some petroleum people who are actually helping him make that decision. Uh, I, would, I would think so, yes. <laughs> okay, maybe we ought to find that out. Yeah. We can help him. Uh, now, also mentioned in the previous answer to a previous question, you said oil can't be our only solution. We have 2% of the reserves and 25% of the consumption. Now, a, a resource where we do have significant reserves is natural gas. And in my part of Texas, we have uh, new technology that allows recovery of natural gas from strata that previously were thought to be inert. And that is ongoing at the present time. As you're aware, there is some controversy about the methods of extraction. And to be certain, all of us do need to be concerned about safety. We've seen it in Japan this week. We saw it in, in the Gulf Coast last year. So we do need to be concerned about safety. But we also need to be concerned about the overregulation of these processes that inhibit our ability to take advantage of a resource that we do have in abundance. Now, on the utilization end, I'm sure you're familiar with people like Boone Pickens who talk about our heavy transportation fleet should be run much more on natural gas rather than liquid petroleum products. What are you doing at the Department of Energy right now in regards to that? Uh, we're supporting pilot uh, programs. Uh, we think, um, especially in delivery vehicle situations where there are central fueling stations, uh, because we don't have a natural gas infrastructure, that that would be a good place to prove uh, natural gas and, and, and establish the technology. Uh, we, I think we had a loan guarantee for uh, natural gas vans for helping handicapped people. We have, we, have, we have supported programs using Recovery Act money for um, centralized uh, fueling stations. Sure, so things like city buses and school buses make sense because they're, they're not long haul vehicles. And they, and, and they always go back to the same place. Correct, they can be centralized. Now, are you working with your counterparts at the Environmental Protection Agency to, to help ensure the correct 
utilization of this resource, the ability to continue to recover it and to be done it, that it's to be done in a, in a safe manner. As you know, the EPA has a couple of studies going on right now as regards to hydrologic fracturing. Are you communicating with them about that? Well, we are, first, um, the Department of Energy is using some resources in this fiscal year to, to look at uh, uh, fracking safety. I think it's something that can be done safely, and but we have to- Can you say that again? The Department of Energy currently. Oh, I think that, say, finish oh, that I thought. Think, okay. I think that uh, the I think that it can be done safely. Did I hear you say that? Uh, I, I believe it's like everything else. We, we, we learn from what is happening, and it can be done much more safely than uh, just as deep water oil uh, drilling can be done more safely than it's been done in the past. We learned from the uh, well, Don't parse your own language. I heard you say it. It can be done safely as a simple statement of fact. It can be done safely. I agree uh, with you, Mr. But, Mr. Secretary. But, uh, but you also have to be on guard. One can't be 100% certain of these things, and, you, and you have to take that responsibility very seriously. Absolutely, and I will tell you, in my, in my home area right now, the public doesn't get the sense that its safety is being protected. That's why I urge you to work with your counterparts at the Environmental Protection Agency. This is an important resource for the country, and we cannot afford it to become locked in where we can't develop it because it was either done incorrectly or unsafe practices were pursued and the public's then reaction against it is such that it just cannot be, uh, that it can't be developed. Just, just briefly on, on Japan for a moment, are you, is your department sending a contingent to Japan or have, has Japan asked for any help from the United States Department of Energy? Our, as I said in my, my opening remarks, we have sent uh, some 33 or 34 people to Japan to to uh, to help them monitor uh, w with equipment. But it, just for what it's worth, I think at some point in the in the future, when you deem it safe, your presence in Japan, I think, would go a long way yes. towards reassuring the people there. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Okay. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the Secretary. Thanks very much for your indulgence with us today. Really appreciate you being here, and I'm going to follow up a little bit on uh, Dr. Burgess's uh, comments a little bit ago. But just kind of give you a little background about my district and how important energy is out there. Ohio overall gets about 80 percent of its energy is coal based, and also, interestingly enough, about 80 percent of everything that comes in and out of Ohio comes in by truck. So if we're talking about oil. Uh, the 5th Congressional District, uh, according to the National Manufacturers, is the 20th largest uh, manufacturing district in Congress. It's also, interestingly enough, the uh, largest ag district in the state of Ohio. We also have two solar manufacturing plants in the district. I have two ethanol plants in my district. Uh, the first four really working turbines in the state of Ohio, I can see from my backyard, there are four of them, uh, not too far from my home. And I'm one that really tru truly believes that we have an all of the above energy policy. And again, that's the, your oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear, and all the alternatives, because we have to really utilize all those. But at the same time, when I'm out talking to my companies, my businesses, the factories across my district, one of the things is that they always comes up in the conversation is we have to have base load capacity to turn these, to turn these machines on in the morning. And I know the question was asked, I think it might have been uh, Mr. Green uh, had asked a little earlier in regards to, you know, where are we at that, you know, through the alternatives? Are, is there anything out there, I think he, the question he posed was in 10 years that uh, they could really start supplanting some of, you know, of the oil, natural gas, coal, and nuclear. But, you know, to make sure that we can compete, and I know the questions have come up here, it all comes down to really jobs and making sure that people have, can get out there and work and that we have these jobs in the future. Is there anything out there right now that can su supplement those four basic large ones that we have right now from nuclear to clean coal to oil and natural gas? I think it's uh, going to be a transition period. Of, um, as I said, if you look at other countries around the world, uh, and if you look at what we're doing here in the United States, that uh, it, you d these things don't happen overnight, that it, it will take decades to make these transitions, and one recognizes that. Well, let me ask this, because at the same time, I know I, especially I, ha I represent uh, quite a few uh, uh, co-ops in my district, and one of the things that they're worried is, is that, the, you know, the cost of having to buy a lot of the alternatives right now are driving up their costs, which are driving out the businesses from the area. 
And do you foresee that happening? If pardon, I, uh, the, the background noise. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of co-ops in my district, and one of the questions that they always bring up to me is that they're fearful that if they have to buy too much on the alternative side. And I know this is being, you know, that we all want to see alternative, but they see it that they're not going to be able to supply power cheaply enough to be able to maintain the businesses that they service right now. And do you see that as a problem? Well, we have to be very sensitive to that, and uh, that's why the Department of Energy is so focused on looking exactly at where, where we think the trajectory will be and, and what are the time scales that, that would be needed in order to bring down the price of renewables uh, so that they are uh, absolutely competitive without subsidy with uh, fossil generation of energy. You know, in, in your testimony, you also on uh, page eight, uh, under the, where the cuts are occurring under the Office of Fossil Energy, uh, how do you define un unconventional fossil energy? Unconventional fossil energy, uh, I would think methane hydrates would be an example of that. This is natural gas trapped in, in uh, crystalline structures of ice. Well, and uh, just kind of following along in the lines that uh, Dr. Birch was talking, especially in the, fra uh, the fracturing question. You know, we now have in Ohio and Pennsylvania and New York, the Utica uh, reserves that are being found. They're saying that probably Ohio They'll be able to uh, get to that to maybe the first. Uh, and again, just making sure, because I know that there's been talk around the hill by some individuals that, uh, you know, fracturing uh, shouldn't be done. And uh, I'm one who has looked at the EPA reports that they've uh, put out from uh, several years back that said that that fracturing can be done. And I know that you'd, you know, Dr. Birch has asked that question of you that, uh, you know, I believe it can be done safely. And, you know, will the Department of Energy also make sure that that can be done and that these people out there aren't going to be impeded to get this energy that we need in this country? I, I think, yes, um, when I said it can be done safely, let me reiterate, can be done is different than is being done safely. I think uh, industry can uh, take the steps needed uh, to, to extract uh, these resources safely. And, and uh, that's why I think it is important that uh, that we continue doing, taking those steps to improve the methods. Well, I guess, and, uh, you know, I guess finally is that uh, as we look at everything that's out there, I think that hopefully the Department of Energy always is looking at all of these alternatives that people are coming up with. And, and I know in my area I have individuals working on clean coal technology and making, trying to make sure that, you know, that you can utilize high sulfur coal that comes from like our region of the country and put it to use since the United States does have such large reserves when it comes to coal. And with that, I appreciate you being here today. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Terry. Or Nebraska. Or Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. Corn, huh? Corn states. It <laughs> confuses tobacco state people. <laughs> uh, At least I got yeah, your name. Yeah, full state. You got your name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it is progress, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Wood, I really appreciate you being here, and uh, I think we all have great respect for, for you and your, your uh, talents that you're lending to the nation right now. Uh, harping on the fracturing, let me ask you a simple question. And you, you mentioned earlier the discussions that uh, you're in discussions with Interior and EPA all the time. Uh, have there been any discussions about limiting fracturing now? And not, I haven't had been part of those discussions. Mm -hmm. I've not been. Okay. Because there's a lot of discussion or rumors that the interior is going to shut down all fracturing within interior lands. And there's rumors that uh, EPA is going to come down on uh, fracking, current fracking techniques. Have you heard any of that within the administration discussions? No. Uh, I, the, the only thing I heard about the EPA is uh, uh, a request that the monitoring be done. Uh, and uh, certainly there have been reports that, uh, of possible contamination and things of that nature. And so they, the, the ones I've heard have said that we should uh, monitor what is being discharged. For example, the fluids, the water being used and the fluids being used in fracking. Uh, as they go into, let's say, sewage treatment plants that uh, the EPA has, uh, I believe, asked for the monitoring and the discharge 
uh, of those sewage plants. Very good, and, and I appreciate that you uh, said to Dr. Burgess that uh, fracking can be done safely. Mm -hmm. uh, without that technique, we aren't going to have the level of natural gas that we're going to count on. Uh, the Bakken uh, shale up in North Dakota, uh, their production would go down greatly. We want to do it safely and cleanly, but we don't want an overreaction and just start shutting it down either. Uh, so we need to do it safely. I appreciate are, are, are you engaged in any activities right now to uh, set out what techniques or uh, changes to make it safe or safer? We, we, right now we do have a small program uh, invest uh, it's um, located in universities to look at um, what are the issues in terms of the safety and the fracking of fluids. The Department of Energy does have expertise in how fluids move around in rock because of um, both carbon capture sequestration, also because of the uh, underground repository work that we need to do. And so that those same technologies can be brought to bear on, on fracking. Well, I got one more question in my minute 45. So uh, I'm going to interrupt with this one. Will you, pr uh, I want to know if there's any reports due or their findings, and I'll send you a written question as fairly common at here at the conclusion of hearings that we'll send written questions to you. I would uh, expect that one from me. It would be nice to know when you'll get that information in so we could look at it too and maybe have you back. But in regard to natural gas, uh, you have a lot of proponents uh, of natural gas known only in electrical generation but moving it toward more towards a transportation fuel. I see in your budget that there's 200 million uh, competitive uh, $200 in the competitive program to encourage communities to invest in electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, can you tell me what measures the DOE is undertaking to promote uh, natural gas vehicles? Yeah, um, as I said, we are have invested in some pilot projects for centralized um, delivery van type of things that where you can go to a centralized fueling station. Uh, I can get back to you on the full details of what we're doing in natural gas. Would appreciate it, and I think the uh, focus, if I could be so bold, is probably in large fleets with on-premises fueling stations. That's uh, correct. And uh, so if the, in regard to providing us information, if you could do that on any of the programs uh, that would help uh, implement or build on-site stations for large fleets, mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Terry. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I Chu, appreciate you being with us today. I want to talk about the broader picture of energy policy. And, and I know a few of my colleagues touched on some of the, uh, the various objectives and over the years where our dependence uh, seems to have increased on, uh, on foreign oil, especially over the history of the Department of Energy. In your mission statement, you talk about ensuring America's energy security. And uh, I think one of the concerns I have is, is when you look at what the current policies are from this administration, it seems like uh, despite the current levels of production, which, uh, which are the result of years of exploration in the past, it seems like this administration has shifted policies away from energy exploration in America. And of course, we're seeing this in a, in a very devastating way in the Gulf of Mexico and the parts of the Outer Continental Shelf uh, that have been closed down where, where only two permits have been issued in 10 months. Uh, and that seems to run counter to even the President's own scientists uh, a panel he had put together after the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon where his own uh, scientists and engineers recommended against any kind of moratorium or now permitorium where uh, you literally are, st are strangling the ability for our country to seek its own energy and which then increases our dependence on countries uh, like those Middle Eastern countries that are so volatile. Uh, so how, how do you, I guess, reconcile what the mission statement of your department is that, that really uh, says you're going to strive to to increase uh, our American energy security uh, when in fact you've got the president uh, initiating uh, policies uh, that close off more areas of our known resources. Well, the president actually increased the, uh, the resources in, in, the, in the sense that uh, more areas were open to exploration um, you know, with 
not such great timing, a couple of weeks before the Macondo disaster. But, um, and but, but has since closed those areas off, and, and they're not issuing permits uh, at any level close to what they were before. And, and while the president may hang his hat on two permits issued in 10 months, uh, that's an embarrassingly low number when, when, you know, when you look at the safety records of those companies that didn't uh, make the mistakes of BP that are being punished for, uh, for BP's actions. Well, the permit permitting of deep water has resumed um, and... Um, would, you, would you consider that an adequate resumption? Uh, two permits in 10 well, months? It's, uh, uh, you could say it's two permits over the last uh, couple weeks as well. So I, I think it has been resumed and, and will continue to resume. Um, the, I think the, um, the investigation, the committee that investigated the deep water spill said that um, you know, it, it, it is not only just BP that has been implicated in this, that the whole industry can up its game in making improvements in safety. Well, and, and there were some serious flaws in, in, in their, uh, their report where they, where they basically tried to say it was the entire industry that was at fault, when, when in fact that's not the case, uh, considering the fact that, that in, in all of the, the wells, thousands of deep water wells that have been drilled, you had one disaster uh, because of a series of mistakes by that partnership uh, that weren't replicated at all of the other wells. So uh, I think it's inaccurate for them to say it's systemic. I would hope you wouldn't think that it's the entire industry that's at fault uh, when you clearly had an example of, of one company uh, in a partnership that, that did cut corners uh, where others didn't. And, and I think that's the key point is there's this kind of broad brush, it seems like, from this administration uh, that, that they're almost shying away from Amer American energy exploration. I want to ask you about a comment you had made earlier uh, referring to use it or lose it provisions and leases. And, and you seem to imply uh, that there are companies that are uh, not utilizing their leases adequately and you, you inferred that maybe other people should be given that ability. Uh, when in fact right now in the Gulf of Mexico, all of those companies that want to go and reestablish what they were doing before and exploring for American energy are not being allowed to. And yet the clock is still ticking on their leases. Now would you support a, a change in policy where if a company does want to expand and go and explore that lease, but right now they're being prevented by the administration, uh, that that clock shouldn't keep running while the administration's holding them back? Uh, I think th the leases, the uh, permits for exploration has started again, and um, uh, where you were talking about uh, a hold on deep water leases for something like six, eight months, uh, I, I think the lease time is considerably longer than that. And, and let, me, let me ask one last question as my time is about to run out. When you were talking about uh, known reserves, you used the term 2% of the world's reserves are in, in America. There's a CRS report, and I'm not sure if you've read it, I'm sure you've read something like this that looks at this, 19 billion, do billion reserves, barrels of oil reserves, uh, or what, what I think are alluded to in this 2% number, but in fact there are about 145 billion barrels of reserves that are uh, estimated to be recoverable using new technology. So there's some outdated numbers when people use this 2% number. First, are you aware of uh, when people say 2%, they're referring to 19 billion, bil billion barrels of known reserves, when in fact it's estimated that there are over 145 billion barrels of reserves in America uh, using the newest technologies? I think you're you're pointing towards, uh, reserves are a very specific thing. It, it's a known asset, bankable asset. Uh, you're talking about p potential future reserves, and, and there is a difference there. Uh, are, there are potential future reserves in the U.S. territories. Would you give an estimate on how much? Well, um, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, um, but I can get them to you, uh, but there, there are significant uh, potential reserves. In I'd appreciate if you'd share that with the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Recognize the gentleman from uh, New Hampshire, Mr. Bass, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I don't come from coal or oil or nuclear. I'm interested in biomass. What's the status of the, uh, 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 the DOE's support for advanced biofuels development? Uh, it's in a very good position. Uh, we have, uh, as you may know, three biofuel centers, and we have a lot of, we do a, a sponsor a lot of research in universities also and national labs. Those biofuel centers uh, have, and other research within D with DOE support, have generated a significant num amount of intellectual property. That intellectual property has been 
uh, being picked up by industry. Already, uh, some of the intellectual property in the first three years of our biofuels centers, uh, advanced biofuels, so this is to make drop-in diesel fuel, gasoline jet fuel from uh, simple sugars using bacteria. That, that's, those things have been licensed, and already there are now plans in the private sector for building pilot plants based on that. So but it's a very good track record. What's the status of the loan? There were, as I recall, when I was here before, Secretary Bodman was announcing or they're beginning a loan guarantee program to build uh, commercial scale uh, advanced biofuels facilities around the country. How many of those have you? That's these are not, I don't know the answer to these questions. How many of these, what's the status of that program? Okay, that, uh, that uh, we are looking at, I, I know we did one uh, loan guarantee, but that's for um, uh, for not what we're talking about. The, this is range fuels. I think the loan guarantee program uh, is constrained in that if the research is too advanced and if it's too much of a pilot, because in our loan guarantee program, we have to make sure that the taxpayer is protected. Mm -hmm. And when it becomes too much of a research enterprise, then there are some constraints. And so uh, I, I can get back to you on the details of, of That's those. That's fine. Well, you made mention of, uh, and, and I, I would like to have a further discussion about that. You mentioned um, uh, run of the river hydro dams. That's hydrokinetics. Is there any action there? No, um, hydro there are two forms, hydrokinetics in the ocean and waves and things that extract uh, wave energy or things that bob up and down or, or flex yeah. like this or currents. Run of the river is you take a little part of the river and you make a detour and put it in a spinning turbine. Yeah, well, let me change the subject then. What about hydrokinetics? Do you know anything about does that? Is there any, anything going on? Well, we, we are supporting some of it. it, it it's, it's a very research-oriented thing. It's, uh, it's certainly not ready for prime time, but there are a number of companies that are very excited about the process. The I'm changing the subject slightly once more. Does the, d does the Energy Department support any research in hydrofracking um, compounds or materials that would be perhaps more environmentally acceptable? Well, right now we aren't supporting research in hydrofracking because um, when very big oil and gas exploration companies like Schlumberger got into it in 1992 mm -hmm. or 91, we got out. Uh, I do know that there are, uh, there is some exploratory work going on. Um, you know, fracking has become mainstream, uh, it, and and so it's now supplying 30 percent of the U.S. gas. There are companies looking at fracking with carbon dioxide as perhaps a better fluid. Lastly, um, I, I'm trying not to express any opinions here. I love RPE, though. Um, is uh, is are there significant difference between the RPE program and the grants that are given out under EERE? -E? Uh, yes, there are. RPE has a very short time scale, a leash of two years, perhaps renewable for yet another year, and that's it. And so it's a very short program uh, that tries to identify, it mostly goes to companies, and it also um, tries to identify what we call radical breakthrough technology. So, so in doing that, it, it also knows full well that some of these grants may turn out not to yield anything. But on the other hand, what it's looking for are really dramatically, uh, dramatic advances that completely change the landscape of our choices. And so it's a, it's a more venture capital approach, if you will, to, to grant. Are there any notable successes there, A, and B, what is the EERE uh, grant program? How does it differ? Okay. First, there are some notable successes in the sense that um, uh, in about Half a dozen of our grants, we've given companies uh, money to do some research. They've done that research, and in less than a year, they were able to go out and raise uh, five times, four times that amount in the private sector because the private sector says, okay, this is great. We now have enough confidence to invest in you. That's precisely what we want to do, the, to, to allow companies to do research and uh, get further funds from the private sector. We are looking in EERE, um, uh, there are now, um, a whole new cast of program directors who are full of energy, and we're looking towards rejuvenating those areas to make it, it to do the best it possibly can in um, in giving out whatever precious dollars we have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Bass. Um, we're going to recognize Mr. Inslee for 30 seconds. Thank you. If we can put this picture up, Mr. Secretary, I just wanted to congratulate you some of your work you're doing in advanced biofuels. I want to show you a picture. This is a picture of the. Uh, 
the U.S. Uh, Green Hornet. It's a picture of an F-18. It's the first jet ever to fly on biofuels, breaking the sound barrier. And you've been doing some great work in conjunction with the DOD. I just want to compliment you and hope you continue that. And is there anything we can do you in 10 seconds that we could really do to help you in that regard? Well, I think you can do much more in appropriations. <laughs> we will work on that. And I'm sure our Republican friends are listening to you with great interest. Thanks very much. Okay. We're always interested in appropriating money. So, uh, <laughs> but Secretary Chu, we thank you for joining us today. We enjoyed the dialogue. We look forward to working with you as we uh, strive to meet the energy needs and safety of our country. And uh, we're, we're going to actually recess until 1.30 because uh, Mr. Jasko has been called down to the White House. And so we'll reconvene at 1.30. And once again, uh, Mr. Secretary, we look forward to working with you and appreciate your uh, time today. All right, thank you.